deserve to yeah. be here. Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, good evening, all of you. Uh, welcome back to International Webinar on Pediatric Airway Problems. This is the sixth session of uh, uh, yeah, in the series. And today we have an important topic. I think this is one of the important topic. Why? Because this is the only uh, airway work, pediatric airway work, which happens in peripheries. That is airway foreign bodies in children. So it's, it's important for all. And today uh, we have a galaxy of distinguished speakers. And one thing special about this meeting is today we have a uh, Lieutenant General, uh, Dr. Venkatesh, now who happens to be the Vice Chancellor of uh, uh, Manipal University, he is with us today and uh, makes this in meeting even more interesting. Welcome you all. With this, uh, I give over to Dr. Uh, uh, E.V. Raman, sir, uh, the moderator. So he is going to con conduct the remaining uh, proceedings. Welcome, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Prahlad. It's always uh, a privilege uh, to chair this uh, or moderate these sessions on international webinars on pediatric airway problems. We've been very lucky that we have uh, uh, been blessed with excellent faculty right from the beginning. We started off with the basics. We started off with evaluation, then went into uh, pediatric tracheostomies, went into um, uh, sleep disordered breathing in children. Then we went to recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. Um, uh, amongst the various topics that we've covered. But we thought this uh, subject of airway foreign bodies is something that is ubiquitous, is much more in underserved areas, and uh, many times the reputation or lack of it uh, depends on your skill to remove foreign bodies, uh, and every foreign body is difficult. The moment it's re removed, it becomes easy. So till you remove it, the foreign body is difficult. So that's the maxim. And in order to make sure that all of us have this basic skill, uh, which is going to make or mar your reputation in the uh, community, apart from the fact that it could be a life-saving event if you manage to do it properly, it requires planning, it requires all those qualities we expect in a good clinician. So in order to, uh, for the people who are already very experienced to recapitulate how to go about it, for the people who have uh, just started off their career, we're going to go through the entire subject today in as much detail as possible. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we're blessed with probably the best faculty, the best speakers today. Um, we have uh, initially uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Neeraj Anand Mathur, who is the additional director general of health services and also the um, uh, chief of um, ENT in uh, Lady Hardin Medical College. He has a vast experience in the children's hospital there, accumulated wealth of information which he's going to uh, share with us. And after that, equally um, well-known speakers are going to follow him. And uh, of course, uh, we are very happy that uh, we have excellent moderators, uh, excellent um, people on the panel. Um, we have, or probably Yogesh, if he has joined, he is uh, from Kathmandu. He is the um, associate professor in the Tribune University Hospital. Then we have uh, Dr. Deepak Mehta will be joining us from the Children's Hospital in Texas very soon. We have uh, Dr. Kishore Sandhu who will be joining very soon. Then we have Sohit uh, all the way from uh, uh, University of Iowa. So it's going to be in a kind of an international exchange, uh, but mostly depending on what our current scenario is in this particular country. Without much ado, I'll start the um, uh, session, but before that I, must confess and uh, tell you this, I've repeated a number of times whenever I got a chance. We're very happy that uh, General Venkatesh is the Vice Chancellor of Manipal University. There have been a couple of ENT surgeons who have uh, really gone up in uh, public life. The people I remember in my lifetime, not in my lifetime, maybe even earlier, uh, was uh, uh, Dr. Cherian, who was the chief of the um, ENT department in Chennai in the Madras Medical College and became the governor of the state of Maharashtra. Then we have our health minister who is an ENT surgeon, of course, now. And uh, it's a great accomplishment, uh, Dr. Venkatesh. We are so proud that you've reached uh, this level. And you're going to guide and um, influence the careers of so many doctors. And, uh, of course, uh, we have so many thoughts as practicing ENT surgeons. I'm sure your influence and your views are going to reshape the lives of many young uh, doctors, apart from the ENT surgeons. We welcome you, too. So we start off. Welcome. We start off with uh, General uh, Mathur, uh, sorry, Dr. Mathur, um, Neeraj Mathur from uh, Lady Hardin Medical College, uh, who's a 
has extensive experience in teaching and plus also one of the pioneer pediatric uh, otolaryngologists of the country uh, with an excellent paper on lateralization of the vocal cords which uh, um, uh, was published in the International Journal of Pediatric Otolaryngology. Uh, Dr. Mathur, uh, can you please share your screen and start with the proceedings? Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. sir. Yeah, you can do the slideshow. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Raman, for introducing me. And uh, I, uh, my uh, regards to all of you, all the participants, and all the faculty. Uh, I have been assigned the task of uh, introducing the subject of foreign body removal, a step-by-step -step guide. Now, it is not possible for anybody to give the step-by-step -step guide on a webinar of a very surgical procedure. Uh, but still, uh, uh, what I will do is I will go into it uh, uh, and give some of my uh, personal, uh, what to the, so to say, advice to uh, some of the new entrants into this the field of uh, bronchology and uh, esophagology. Basically, today we'll be talking about bronchoscopy. So, the bronchoscopy uh, has the history uh, right from 1717 when. Were the first two that did the bronchotomy to take out the foreign body. And then the foreign body removal uh, has been done from translaryngeal uh, root by uh, not, no, none other than Gustav Kellian from Germany. And uh, he's uh, the main man uh, whose photograph comes whenever you see any foreign body removal, besides Chevalier Jackson, who was a, an American, and he did. In 1905, he reported a case of foreign body removal, uh, and he is considered to be the father of aerodigestive foreign body removal. And also, at the same time, there was a Victor Negus, uh, a Britisher, who was working, uh, who worked with Jackson, because Jackson also went to UK uh, during his uh, career and worked there. So probably there he worked, and uh, there. Probably he followed later on to him to America also and improved the design of Jackson bronchoscope. And we all know there are two types of bronchoscopes, the Jackson and the Negus type, one with the distal lighting system and the other with the proximal lighting system. It is popularly, uh, in, uh, they are introduced to uh, people with a different type of bronchoscope like this. But um, Actually speaking, when you do little literature search, much more than that, then there is much more than this proximal and distal lighting system attached to their names than just um, their comparison uh, uh, because of these two uh, methodologies of uh, lighting system. A pediatric age group is the most vulnerable age group for the foreign body bronchus, and 80% of the patients are pediatric. And most of them are less than three years, and most of them are between six months and three years of age, and peak being between one and one and a half years. Uh, that is the peak period when uh, foreign bodies usually come uh, in the bronchus. And uh, as we all know, uh, typical history will be, uh, in these cases, uh, uh, the sneeze uh, uh, in which the inspiratory phase of the sneeze takes the foreign body, which is there lying inside the mouth of the child, uh, be uh, having put by uh, um, a, uh, um, uh, his brother or a sister, or elder brother or a sister, or by himself uh, or herself into the mouth. And that goes in, that is typical history, and it goes into the bronchus. Uh, they, would, they would be playing or eating at the same time, or they and there is an immature solo, and there is lack of molar grinding, and there is high place larynx. So all this predispose to the foreign body going into the bronchus or into the trachea and lodging there. Uh, a right, a right bronchus is more prone that because of the wider lumen and the vertical, and 80 to 90 percent would be there. And the larynx will be next. Uh, and these are the foreign bodies which usually you get. And the most of the most common foreign bodies, as we know, is the peanut in our country. 
and uh, other nuts which are there in, in if you go to your uh, i worked in uk so their most common foreign body and the most difficult nut to be removed was the hazelnut it had lot of uh, you know reaction around it uh, but peanut fortunately doesn't have much of reaction around it so our nuts though peanuts are there inside the foreign body as a bronchus bronchial foreign body they remain remain quite unreactive and uh, very easy to remove um, uh, unlike the hazelnuts which are very difficult to remove uh, probably they are not only with reaction is there more but they are coated with uh, uh, with the oil and also the reaction is much more uh, screws nails pins marbles buttons toys hair clips and these are all foreign bodies which all of us have removed one time or the other so the, if there is a foreign body what do we do um, uh, uh, there is no restaurant in U us or uk which doesn't when you enter it doesn't uh, uh, tell you about the himlish maneuver this is mandatory that you have to have the photograph of himlish maneuver and how to do it on to the entrance of the uh, of the restaurant any restaurant and uh, uh, this is we all have learned uh, red cross has uh, uh, made it more popular but though american um, have lately Uh, remove the name of uh, um, himlish maneuver and they they call it as a uh, abdominal thrust so uh, whatever it is uh, it is an abdominal thrust upper abdomen above the navel you just make a thrust with the fist of one hand uh, the the thumb is towards the abdomen of the patient and the other one other hand pushes the thing inside and you do five uh, um, uh, thrust like that and try uh, the patient tries to up out and usually it works 70% of the cases it may work so and the, then there can be back blows chest thrust in small children and finger sweep or the grasp can also be done if you can see the foreign body inside the mouth and you are an ent surgeon maybe you can do it i have done it myself on my child <laughs> so but it is risky uh this is the himlich maneuver and this is chest thrust um if it, the uh, the patient is a pregnant woman then you have to do it a uh, little above little above and uh, towards much more towards the breast bone a lower part of it uh, so that uh, uh, the thing works and in the children you do like this i have uh, both um, um, uh, in front as well as on the back and uh, hopefully the foreign body may come out but uh, it may not uh, symptoms and signs Uh, of the foreign body, we all uh, know can be um, uh, somebody can witness the aspiration. Um, uh, there can be no symptoms. There can be classic triad of choking, coughing, and wheezing. We know there can be cyanosis, and the signs can be stridor or wheezing, tachypnea, and things like that. Now we devise one algorithm. Uh, this is our own algorithm uh, because most of the time, what used to happen was. That our center is probably in the north, so north, northern part of the world. Uh, it has got the highest uh, um, uh, cases which we have done of the foreign body, and uh, it's a referral center. Though in the foreign body there cannot be much of a referral referral center, especially in the bronchial foreign body. Either the patient will survive or patient will die. Uh, he may not reach. Uh, he may not be able to travel for 500, 300, 400 kilometers for the foreign body removal. So the uh, Uh, referral center means in delhi we are the referral center if somebody goes to uh, some other hospital then usually they are referred to us so that's why we have got the highest uh, of rates of doing the foreign body and uh, uh, so we had to devise one algorithm and uh, this was one of my thesis which i did and uh, we devised one algorithm as to which uh, which one who, who will qualify for a foreign body uh, removal by bronchoscopy because many a times there was a confusion whether to do bronchoscopy or not so now we out of hunt, we used to give hunt, uh, maximum 100 marks and uh, the marks were given like this witnessing aspiration if somebody has witnessed 40 marks and 40 marks is for bronchoscopy so if somebody has witnessed that the person has aspirated means he can go in for the for, for the bronchoscopy no more investigation uh, or no more proof is required you can do the investigation but no more proof is required for that that qualifies for bronchoscopy if the patient is having symptoms and somebody has witnessed the aspiration however uh, if somebody has not witnessed the aspiration 
in a small child then dyspnea respiratory distress will um, will get 20 marks 20 points wheezing strider will get 10 points cough will get 10 points oscillatory findings will get 20 points radiological findings matching with the history of duration will get 20 points radiological findings not matching with duration of history will get 10 points fever will get 5 points so if anybody gets 40 points he qualifies for for bronchoscopy in an emergency so that is what we had devised symptoms and signs we know we have just uh, 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 looked at onto this slide uh, uh, the location of the foreign body can be the larynx the trachea and the bronchus and these are the the symptoms as we know uh, uh, the lower is the uh, foreign body uh, the, the it will go into the wheezing part and the uh, and the larynx it will be stridulous and or it's complete choking uh, so, the types of obstruction uh, uh, can also be, be, be uh, we should know about it because uh, we will be dealing with the uh, x-rays. So, whether it is a bypass valve or a check valve obstruction or stop valve obstruction, these will be the findings uh, in, uh, in the cases as uh, the obstruction is. So, uh, this slide is known to all of us. So, uh, so stages of the foreign body aspiration, the initial phase, as we know, is a choking, epi choking episode. Then there's a cough, the body throws out that, tries to throw it out, and, or there is a gagging, if it can't throw out and no breathing can go in. And then the, the no x-ray change will happen, no symptoms may be there in 50%, 20% of the case, cases. And caregivers uh, could be the reason, uh, their neglect uh, for this. Uh, similarly, uh, then, uh, then to diagnose these foreign bodies, first of all, we will have to do the chest X-ray. And most of the time, PHS X-ray is good enough uh, because the child is too much in distress. You may not be able to do too many X-rays and, uh, and nothing more is required. One PA and if need be, one lateral. Lateral has got more value if there is a foreign body which is, uh, which is uh, radio opaque and it's a metallic foreign body and, you, and it is uh, going... Uh, and single foreign body, and uh, 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 which you may miss if uh, uh, if you do not do the if you just do the bronchoscopy and you are not uh, 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 conversant about uh, the hidden areas in the bronchoscope uh, by while you're doing the bronchoscopy. So um, the chest X-ray could be normal, could be hyperinflated, could be emphysematous, atelectasis, uh, pneumonia, or pneumothorax, uh, uh, or mediastinal shift. CT scan, virtual bronchoscopy, fluoroscopy. Very rarely you will require it. In fact, no, no time you will require it. Computerized tomography has got a role if it is an extramural foreign body. If uh, the foreign body has gone outside the confines of the bronchus, bronchus, then it will have a role. Otherwise, normally, computerized tomography will have no role. Should not be unnecessarily the wastage of money and the time should not be done on just doing the CD or these virtual bronchoscopies. It is basically a clinical thing. Uh, take the bronchoscope and get it as fast as possible out. That is the treatment. Inspiratory radiograph in children can be like this. As you can see, uh, one side is uh, hyperinflated. Uh, similarly, the expiratory phase makes it more prominent on the uh, where the foreign body is because the other chest uh, exhales out the oxygen, uh, the, the air, but the, uh, the, uh, the other the side where there is a foreign body, if it is a, uh, it doesn't, it prevents the, uh, the air to be coming out and it becomes, it looks more hyperinflated. Similarly, um, here there is a pre and the post operative uh, photograph. This is the virtual bronchoscopy. It has got a very limited role, but yes, it has got some role in some of the foreign bodies, which could be, which could have not been, which could have been missed. Uh, or could be lying in an area where the bronchoscope could not uh, probably reach and uh, you are still skeptic skeptical that, uh, that probably it is a foreign body. So the laryngeal foreign body we just talked about, Himmlich maneuver, direct laryngoscopy or tracheostomy has got the role in it and we do it like that. But the foreign body of the bronchus, the rigid bronchoscopy or the flexible bronchoscopy. Now it's always, um, there, 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 is a, there is a tussle between the uh, uh, the uh, pediatric pulmonologist and the ENT surgeon 
um, uh, there is one pediatric pulmonologist in our uh, hospital also who tries to put the flexible bronchoscope in most of the cases and most of the time he fails. So um, uh, this foreign body is not to be taken out with the flexible bronchoscopy because most of the time you will, you will not be able to take out. It will be unnecessarily a hazard to a child who is already whose airway is compromised and uh, you may lose the child um, while doing this procedure and uh, uh, it adds to no advantage at all. Um, uh, you, the child is much safer in the, in the operation theater with the rigid bronchoscope than fiddling around with, in the emergency condition uh, with the child uh, already airway compromised with, a, with, with no ventilating port in a small, uh, what, even if it is a small bronchoscope. Um, uh, because uh, even if you are able to take that bronchoscope in, which you will be able to, but uh, you will not be able to grasp that with the tiny forceps that uh, they have. And uh, most of the time, it will not be retrievable. So this exercise should not be done. It can be, it can be a good exercise in check bronchoscopy, but it should be not be, uh, I do not advise this to be taken as an exercise in an emergency bronchoscopy, in small children especially. We are very familiar with Pfizer's law, and uh, we know that uh, if there is 50% reduction in the airway, then 16 times is the airway resistance, whereas if it is 25% reduction, or the resistance increases only three times. So as the uh, uh, airway uh, decreases, the reduction in the air, uh, the, the, uh, the problem becomes much more and more. And uh, now there is no way, uh, there are various um, types of strider and there are various signs um, in small children, uh, which can be learned and you can, you, can, you can say that this is subglottic stenosis, this is probably foreign body, this is laryngomalacia, things like that. But you cannot be 100% sure ever. So uh, uh, the examination, if it's a foreign body, uh, uh, the for, uh, you, and you have not seen the patient for, uh, aspirating, then uh, it is likely, it is possible that it could be something else also or in vice versa. So uh, what do we do while the, while the patient is there and um, he's waiting? We, um, so this is the most, a crucial time while the patient, while the anesthetist is being called, the ENT surgeon is being called. Uh, uh, what, what should the uh, what, what should the resident doctor be doing? So he should be oxygenating the child. He should be monitoring the child or the patient, if he's adult or whoever he is. And uh, steroids should can be tried. ADR nebulization can be given if, if wherever appropriate. Uh, it has ADR uh, nebulization has got the role in the laryngotracheal bronchitis and epiglottitis and uh, uh, things like that, but it doesn't have much role in foreign body. But if it has caused some edema, if it was a large foreign body gone through the uh, uh, and uh, in, uh, uh, already produced uh, uh, or producing a lot of uh, edema, then ADR nebulization also has got a role and it can. So this is the this is what an airway um, uh, OPD or the, uh, the emergency room should be looking like and uh, should have all these things the epinephrine, the dexamethasone, uh, the monitor, the hood, the oxygenation and things like that. Now uh, these are the bronchoscopes and uh, the, on the left side you see the Chevalier Jackson's first generated rigid bronchoscope. It looks more like a laryngoscope, isn't it? So um, uh, or the spatial speculum. Uh, but it is a bronchoscope. It was a shorter bronchoscope which he developed because he was uh, uh, not going further and uh, he, he was actually he must have gone only until the trachea with this bronchoscope. Uh, but it is it was a, a first eliminated rigid bronchoscope. Uh, then uh, then of course these uh, bronchoscopic tubes came and uh, these were the uh, uh, Chevalier Jackson's bronchoscope as we all know with the distal lighting system. And uh, Negus were pro pro proximal lighting system, so a little broader uh, uh, at the proximal and uh, Negus ones. So uh, these are the tubes, and uh, the tubes uh, um, have got um, uh, can be ventilating and can be uh, non ventilating bronchoscope above one or the ventilating ones. And uh, there are certain names which are, uh, which are uh, attached to these bronchoscopes, and we know 
that the stores and the wolf were the two main companies all throughout uh, which had been making these uh, 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 equipments for the for the bronchoscopy and uh, george pilling he was uh, the person who worked, worked with chevalier jackson and he was the instrument maker for him and uh, so the uh, most of the instruments in U us were from the george from the pelling uh, uh, and uh, germans made the stores in the wall and uh, 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 then there was that there is one edwin uh, uh, Ed, edwin royals who devised and who in, in, in uh, you know um, what he did was uh, uh, I can't see my slide myself. Actually, what has happened is we also lost your slides. Can you okay. reshare? Can you reshare your presentation? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Deepak from uh, Texas Children's Hospital has joined us. Welcome, Deepak. Actually, I'm yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's coming. Okay. No, 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 no. We could see it again. It uh, stopped. We yeah. saw chest X-ray. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm just coming there actually. Uh, Can you see now? Uh, it's yet to come, sir. Is it coming? Uh, not no. yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. I, I'm sh seeing your probably uh, when I say slide share. Yeah. I'm not able to see my. Can you see my slide now? No. Not yet, sir. Share screen or new share you will have to do. Click that. And uh, again, click that uh, choice of your this thing. I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm not able to. N new share, maybe. You share, share, share screen. Yeah, share screen. Click share screen. But I'm not able. To... You're not getting the option? Have you opened your PowerPoint presentation, sir? Yeah, I'm, I've opened my PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, uh, go to share screen or new share. No, in my PowerPoint, I do. I, I'm sharing it from that um, uh, Zoom. Zoom, yeah, Zoom. What happens when you click uh, share screen? I, I am not able to... <sighs> I'm not able to see. Yeah, now I'm able to see. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's coming, sir. Coming. It's coming. coming. Yeah, they're okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the ad. Uh, sorry for uh, this delay. Uh, uh, Edwin Bor uh, Royals were uh, tried to uh, do the optical part of this uh, uh, thing, and uh, he uh, increased uh, the, op uh, the op He made the. Op uh, Devised, uh, helped in devising, making the optical telescope, optical forceps, op, uh, fiber optic elimination techniques, and things like that. And then the bronchoscopic photography uh, uh, was added by Paul H. Hollinger. He was at the main role 
and then came the era when the uh, when the stents and the use of NDA came and the HF pneumon and uh, one of my my uh, uh, my brother-in-law he worked uh, in US uh, and um, uh, uh, with him and uh, they have got a lot of papers they they they, they devised uh, and uh, uh, suddenly there was uh, then there was uh, again an interest in the uh, in the in the use of uh, rigid bronchoscopy which in the late 80s was taken away by the fiber optic bronchoscopy and uh, uh, we lost both hf dumon and praveen and praveen Mahfoud. both of them we lost last year uh, uh, no dumon uh, we lo lost on 14th of july and uh, praveen we lost uh, 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 last year these are the bronchoscopes um, uh, the, the um, Jackson type, which we all know. Now, this is the this is the most important chart, which should be there in every operation theater of ENG where the bronchoscopy is being done. This chart, along with the chart of uh, uh, by Charles D. Bluestone, uh, in uh, the, sorry, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the Cincinnati group chart. Um, uh, uh, should be there in each in, in, in all operation theater. But one of the subglottic stenosis and the other one of the uh, of the size of the bronchoscope. Now the size of the bronchoscope uh, is uh, to start with with the 2.5 in the premature children, uh, and then it can go uh, higher and higher. But uh, 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 and uh, we should also be conversant whether it, uh, we are uh, what is the inner diameter and what is the outer diameter because the instrument size will be dependent on the inner diameter. So, what about the emergency bronchoscopy? Is it getting cooler? Yes, it is getting cooler. One of the days when the bronchoscopist, like when we started our career, I used the Chevalier Jackson's, those old non-ventilating bronchoscopes, which had very dim light at the end uh, because our light source was also not very good. And uh, you had to have six by six vision, no chance of, no uh, um, press bio could do that bronchoscopy. And uh, uh, you had to have very good vision and uh, you had to have very good tactile things also. Half the thing was done with tactile. And, uh, uh, and it, uh, uh, the anesthesia part was also not optimal. So you had to be very quick uh, as well as uh, uh, and uh, all the instruments were not there. Uh, there was no, there was no camera, nothing. So uh, they, it was much more of a challenge. I think it was hundred times more of a challenge, thirty years back doing a bronchoscopy than it is now. It is very cool now. Uh, anybody and everybody in the in the theater watches you doing bronchoscopy, and everyone is almost doing the bronchoscopy while you are doing it. So. Um, it has become a very good learning thing now, and uh, uh, the challenge is much lesser now. The persons behind uh, is is he important now? Yes, he is somewhat important. I, I won't say that he has become totally irrelevant, and the robot can come and do the bronchoscopy. We have not reached to that stage, but yes, it has. He has lost his relevance to a great extent. Uh, he is not something who is indispensable that only I can do bronchoscopy, that person cannot. No, no more that thing. So the person behind has become less and less important. And the endoscopists are and have to be distributed. Like uh, 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 so this uh, point I wanted to say that um, uh, we have to have the endoscopists distributed all over the places and they have been uh, all over the world. You cannot travel for 300, 400 kilometers to get the emergency bronchoscopy done. So that is not possible. So the endoscopists had been there all over all the places and everyone has got some experience all the places. I know very small places also where people had been doing bronchoscopies and doing it well. And um, uh, uh, But there had been chances when we have got failed bronchoscopies referred to us from as far as uh, very far part of the country, uh, some eastern part of the country and very uh, from thousands and thousands of kilometers also. But that is that will not be usually be the case. 
uh, most of the patients will be from around. Now, which are the four chips which have which are very useful? Now, the one which I've marked at, in the with the red in the circle is the most important and the most 90% of foreign bodies which we remove come out with this. This is the most least damaging forceps. It's a cup forceps. Though it's not called the peanut forceps by stores, they call peanut forceps is some, to something with which we never take out the free peanuts. Their, their peanuts are different. They call peanuts some, they, 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 what they call peanut is what we don't call. We, our peanut is mungkhali. And that comes out very, very easily with this forceps, not with the peanut forceps that which the stores call. But yes, it is good to have that forceps also. Um, uh, they, they are grasping peanut forceps, which is like this. Um, uh, and uh, but uh, we use this forceps as the most common forceps, as the least damaging forceps, and most of the peanuts will come out with this. And there are different other forceps, serrated forceps you may have to use sometimes. And uh, uh, some large peanut forceps and uh, uh, angled serrated forceps, and for taking out the coin, the straight, the, the uh, flat forceps. And uh, uh, the here you can see the, the fully integrated bronchoscopic forceps. And now, last uh, in the last, I will show you one uh, one interesting slide uh, by one work done by an Indian in the, uh, uh, who devised one bronchoscope. Uh, uh, which is much more integrated than this. Um, and uh, uh, it had to come one day. We, we, I used to talk about it many a times that it should come, that which has got the uh, uh, LED lights, uh, LEDs uh, uh, and the camera here and uh, uh, at the tip and then the cables going inside, six of them. And then there is a USB something here. And then, then the electronics uh, take care of the rest of the thing. So it has got nothing but the tube and and uh, and a vent here. So that, that is what is actually fully integrated optical bronchoscopic forceps and not that this one. This is still a step lower than the uh, fully integrated optical rigid bronchoscopic forceps which is divide, devised by uh, Wolf. So uh, that is a very good uh, thing which has come up. So this is the uh, Texas semi-flexible endoscope uh, bronchoscope, which has come up and uh, which has got a long telescope, uh, telescope uh, which goes till here and which is angled and it can go to the tip and uh, attach to the camera and things like that. And uh, you have the vent here and the light source there and the suction and the irrigation tubes there. So, but this is what I was talking about. This is uh, by Jawale, uh, it has been published in International Journal of uh, Laryngology and Head Neck Surgery as a letter to it. Uh, very surprisingly, I would have uh, recommended it for a full text article. And uh, 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 and uh, he has talked about uh, this device. It has come uh, in 2019. And uh, they, they have claimed that they will be making, they are, they are already making or they will be making it in $300. And uh, so this is what we require. Uh, these are the flexible endoscopes with a chip on tip camera and uh, uh, they can be uh, uh, very useful, but not for the foreign body removal, but for, uh, for, uh, for uh, check bronchoscopy and things like that. Uh, it, they can be very useful. And uh, Machida Corporation and Asahi Pentex Corporation uh, were the two Thanks uh, to uh, uh, main agencies which you started making, which had a lot of uh, role in uh, producing these instruments. And uh, so these instruments are, what, what are the instruments which we require are the laryngoscope, age appropriate size, Hopkins trot telescope, zero degree, vent, rigid ventilating bronchoscope, appropriate size, camera or the video tower, Rigid laryngeal and tracheal suction catheters, appropriate size, flexible suction catheters to fit through the side port of the bronchoscope, optical forceps, non optical forceps, if the optical forceps are not to be used. I many times use non optical forceps for two reasons. Optical forceps will not go inside the three millimeter, uh, size three bronchoscope. And most of the children will require size three bronchoscope. So, uh, so 
it, it is of no use the optical force so uh, uh, we what we'll be using is the forceps and the uh, non -op uh, and and the telescope alternately and that is what most of these small smallest children will be requiring you put in the bronchoscope you put in the telescope you see the foreign body you remove the telescope you put in the bronchoscope use your tactile take out the foreign body use the telescope again see the, the foreign body is completely removed not removed put in the forceps again take out the foreign body use you should have good um, idea of the forceps space and uh, you uh, usually get with, with the tactile the, the idea of the forceps space and take out the foreign body and check it. So these are the, this is the usual way with which foreign bodies move. Optical forceps are used for the small grown up children or for the adults. Uh, in very small children where the bronchoscopy, most of the bronchoscopy is done, the optical forces will be of no use. Uh, but uh, the equipment which, uh, which, uh, which has been developed now with the, uh, by uh, Jawale, yeah, that could be used because it doesn't use the optical forceps. It uses, it will use just, just the forceps, and uh, that will be of great benefit there. And uh, because that, the forceps part doesn't go along with the optical part. Optical part is in the tube, so the op that part which was being used inside the tube for the optics has been taken care by the tube itself, and that is the biggest advantage of that of that equipment that they have made. And I had this thing in mind for a long, long time. Why it can't be done like that, but um, he's done it. Anyway, good. Contraindications, multiple medical comorbidities could be contraindications, but there is no contraindication as such for the foreign body removal. Actually, uh, uh, whatever may be the contraindication has to be surmounted and you have to do it. What will be the position? The position will be supine, occiput little raised, neck extended, and the shoulders slightly raised also. Sniff position. And how will you make it? Will be a small pillow or a ring under the occiput, support extending onto the shoulder. So neck should not be left like that, hanging in the air. Otherwise, patient will have bad neck, if, especially if he's an adult and uh, grown up man. Uh, so um, the neck should be supported also, and there should be small pillow. Anesthesia is usually the general anesthesia. Experience anesthetics in pediatric airway would be uh, preferable, but uh, you can't choose uh, in emergency your anesthetics or the surgeon. It has to be done as fast as quickly as possible in the minimal possible time. Two things are important in the foreign world. One, the time and the time. First time is how quickly you do it. If it is real emergency, they, 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 they are three types of uh, foreign body uh, timings. One is one will require immediate foreign body. For that also we have a score. One is that if, if the child comes at two, two o'clock at night, then you have to do at two o'clock at night only. So that is one group. Another group is that if the child comes at two o'clock at night, then you can wait till 10 o'clock in the morning. So that is semi-emergency group for which we have got algorithm. And the third is that you can do it later on also. Uh, doesn't matter. You can do it after week. So but if the child requires immediate uh, bronchoscopy, then that time is crucial. It is better to do it than not to do it and uh, 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 look for a surgeon who can do it very well um, uh, if, it is, if the time is so crucial. Like a laryngeal foreign body, it has to be removed by whosoever is there but at that time. So even if he is not an ENT surgeon, he has to do it. So, so time is very crucial and it will depend as to how much is the obstruction. So, that time is important, plus the time taken for doing the bronchoscopy is very, very crucial. Bronchoscopy cannot go for hours and or, or for minutes, many minutes, or you know, half an hour or 15 minutes. It cannot go like that. Bronchoscopy has to be done very quickly. It should be done preferably in seconds. If that is not possible, then in a minute or a two, if it is for the foreign body. And it is for them. So it has to be quickly done. So both the timings are important. The time of doing it and the time taken for doing it is both the things are important. Avoid preoperative sedation in the patients with spider. Uh, intravenous excess prior to beginning should be there. Spontaneous ventilation is preferred over apneic techniques. 
laryngoscopy ideally be performed by the endoscopist himself rather than by the anesthesiologist if the ventilating bronchoscopy is to be introduced straight away. But if you are um, you are planning that you will first introduce the endotracheal tube and then take out the endotracheal tube and then put in the bronchoscope, that is also a possibility. Then you will then you can uh, ask your anesthetist to put in the tube. But uh, usually, most of the times, uh, uh, we do not uh, do that that way. And I prefer to straight away go in and put my ventilating process and avoid too much of positive pressure ventilation. Now, this is the way that we introduce the bronchoscope and uh, patient is supine, cervical spine flexed, head extended at all the cervical joints and the left hand steadies, protects and controls the upper jaw. And this is how in a pen holding position uh, with, with the left index finger guiding me and uh, uh, and guiding my length of introduction also um, uh, 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 is uh, guided how much length is introduced inside by the left index finger and this uh, you you keep sliding your bronchoscope in but uh, the first part is easy through the right side of the mouth lifting the tongue up to the epiglottis and identify the glottis this is a, this is easy and uh, th this is done. But all this, till the time the larynx is there, seen, and you have introduced till inside the larynx bronchoscope, the commonest mistake done by, by most of the residents is they are looking through the bronchoscope and doing this. This is the commonest mistake. Never do it. You should not be looking through the bronchoscope till you have reached below the cords. You should be looking outside the bronchoscope. Outside, uh, I mean, you should be doing the laryngoscopy and putting the bronchoscope and seeing from outside. Don't have the tubular vision right from the beginning. Your tubular vision should come once you are below the cords. Then you'll be seeing through the bronchoscope. Before that, should not. Otherwise, you'll be unnecessarily injuring the laryngeal cord, laryng larynx or the cords and you will be taking more time to put in the bronchoscope. So never, never put in, not never start seeing through the bronchoscope. And this is the examination, inspect the trachea and the carina, rotate the head to the right and to the left to see the left or the right side. And we, we all know about this. There is uh, this. And then you do the foreign body retrieval, use the telescopic forceps these days. Uh, 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 or uh, you can use just the forceps or the and the telescope separately, as I told you, and uh, uh, do the suction. Uh, suction should be appropriate size. Whenever doing the suction, one you should be, uh, we should be very careful. Suction should not be put on while putting in the suction. It should reach where it has to reach, and then the suction should be put on. Otherwise, the patient will be desaturating again and again and again and again. And he is already desaturated. So don't suck out his oxygen, which you are giving by uh, putting the suction on while you're taking it till the foreign body. Put, take it till the foreign body and attach the suction and detach the suction there itself. And um, respect the mucosa. Enough injury has already been done. Don't injure it more. Do no harm. Always I say, it's so important, you know, um, uh, that uh, uh, ethics, the, uh, the, the Hippocratic Oath that we take, do no harm. It is so important in everything. And it is so important here. If we can't do good, do no harm. Because the harm that you do, uh, somebody will not be able to you know, rectify it also because uh, the patient would have gone by that time. So do, do not harm. If, we, if you are not, not confident and you think that it is beyond you or your equipment is not good enough, you have, your equipment will not uh, be able to take it out. Immediately come out and give it to the anesthetist back and tell him that I'll come later or I'll bring somebody else. Don't waste time. You will have the feeling that you will not be able to take out. The moment that feeling comes, come out. Do no harm and do respect the mucosa completely. Respect the mucosa completely and uh, don't injure the mucosa because it's it may be edematous mucosa if the foreign body is old, the granulations it will be start bleeding. So, do, do, do respect the mucosa. And decongestion methods uh, you should try. 
put the uh, if they are graduations put in the uh, uh, put in the uh, adenosine uh, swab there on the plaget there for some time before you start retrieving it because it will start bleeding and then you will become you know it will be more difficult for you to take it out so first decongest around first decongest around take little time there first decongest around if it had been impacted foreign body and the granulations around for a long time use that time when it is absolutely not bleeding decongest it then rather than decongesting at the time when it is already started bleeding so uh, and uh, then take out the foreign body complications uh, hemorrhage is the most common complication and uh, uh, if there is a foreign body which you think has gone outside the lumen we had many times nails needles and um, toys which had gone outside confines of the foreign body or of the bronchus now there there is a role of ct scan these days that you should know how much uh, is it involving a major other major structure in it has it gone just gone outside and lying just outside the lum uh, uh, the lumen and it is not pierced to some other structure or it has pierced to some other structure also so be careful removing a foreign body uh, it is still easy to take out intramural foreign bodies which have gone inside the lumen uh, the wall of the bronchus and then not gone out that is no problem but if it is gone beyond the confines of the bronchus and into the into the lungs somewhere uh, and uh, there, there is some vessel there or something there or um, uh, or it it, it is uh, um, uh, it, uh, at at a level where just at the uh, uh, tracheal bifurcation and it has gone outside the trach uh, bronchus and gone uh, and could be resting very near to some major vessel then that's this could be problem and there there is a role for ct scan injury to the teeth and gum should always be avoided there that is uh, unpardonable damage that you one can do um, uh, that just shows the carelessness of the surgeon uh, no teeth and no gum should be damaged uh, in this procedure gum what may failure to remove the foreign body can be there that should not be a, that should not be taken as a Uh, as anything against the surgeon at all. Uh, in fact, I would say that if the surgeon comes and says that uh, I could not remove the foreign body, he has. It is just like aborting a flight, a, a landing. It is just like um, a pilot has aborted landing. If the pilot says that I have could not land and I have aborted the landing, probably he has taken the better decision than he if he had landed. So. Uh, it is failure to remove a foreign body is no not a failure of a surgeon it is a failure of a procedure because of the circumstances or because of the medical condition so uh, failure to remove a foreign body and pneumothorax or the pneumomedius and i'm focus common errors we know are the failing to carefully check the equipment before procedure grasping hastily causing break Uh, of uh, the uh, foreign body into pieces so we should always have the actual foreign body with us a duplicate foreign body with us if we are not dealing with say peanut or things like that and even in the peanut you should ask the parent uh, do you think that patient that uh, the child has taken the complete peanut uh, or uh, you you think the child could have chewed or could have taken a small piece of peanut so it is very important to know what was what was the shape and the size of the foreign body and uh, the duplicate foreign body comes very handy if it is available and uh, dislodgement of the glot uh, at the glottis to the cause of the airway obstruction is very uh, common error and the failure to recognize the residual or the additional foreign bodies is a very very common uh, error which is the, there that you leave behind some foreign body uh, thinking that you have removed the complete one flexible for, for bronchoscopy we have already discussed that it has got very limited role but it has got some role in check bronchoscopies and it has got some very very limited role in some foreign bodies very small foreign bodies which could be silently lying in bronchus uh, and um, uh, the bronchoscopy being done for some other reason i mean uh, uh, the the pulmonologists thought that it was uh, it was a chronic condition it was a 
uh, some uh, chronic uh, pulmonary condition that he was dealing with and for which he was doing a bronchoscopy and uh, during the course of his bronchoscopy he finds some foreign body lying there and um, he removes it so it's fine but he may not be able to remove it even then but uh, he may if he removes it it's fine at that time because here it's not an emergency it's silently lying it's a chronic condition and uh, he, it's not causing any respiratory distress so this child is much more safer for the foreign body removal with the bronchoscopy with the flexible bronchoscope which doesn't have any vents uh, so this is the procedure that, that we do and in children and under general anesthesia now these are the positions as you know uh, which have been marked 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 and out of this the usual position at which you will find the foreign bodies are at 4 7 9 5 and 1 and uh, uh, 4 7 9 5 1 positions uh, are the usual positions and uh, they are easy to take out easy to take out uh, no not uh, they are in line and you'll be able to see and you will be able to take out difficult views and difficult positions of to for the body, foreign bodies to take out are 11 12 13 and 6 where it is upwards you know uh, apical side is going or it's going to the middle so it's and it's very much angled so there it is usually the foreign bodies will not be at these positions unless they have uh, somebody has already tried or some positive pressure ventilations have been given for a long time and then they have been dislodged from the primary position that the foreign body had taken. It has been dislodged to these positions. They usually get dislodged to these positions rather than primarily being lying at that position. Primarily, they will be lying at a very comfortable position and uh, will be easy to take out. So this you should always keep in mind. There are some other algor algorithm also uh, you know, people have given. Like this is one algorithm in which children admitted to the suspected foreign body is given score of one if uh, if not witness choking, noisy breathing, strider, dys dysphonia given one more, new onset, recurrent, persistent, bees given two, unilateral reduced air entry given one, and abdominal uh, abnormal chest X-ray uh, of uh, chest X-ray given two. So and they have given the scores. If it is less than one, then close follow up. If it is two to three, then flexible bronchoscopy. If it is four to five, rigid bronchoscopy, uh, and if it is more than five, then prompt prompt rigid bronchoscope. So these are some algorithms which have been devised by many people. Repeat bronchoscopy should always be done if you found that there was severe edema, failure to remove completely or unsure of the removal and abandoning the procedure and attempting second look after due uh, to the prolonged operative time. So if the operative time is getting more and more, suppose you have removed the foreign body or you have not been able to remove the foreign body, and the operative time, the patient has, the RSS has told you one or twice, once or twice that the patient is desaturating. And then again, you he gave the patient back to him and completely, uh, you know, oxygenated. And again, or the patient has desaturated many times, you know, or, uh, or the patient is really desaturated. You should stop. And it is much better to go again the next day or a few hours later than to keep doing again and again the procedure and prolonging the procedure. That will That is the most common cause of mortality. So the procedure operative time should be as less as possible, should not go beyond reasonable time. It depends. The reasonable time will depend on what type of bronchoscope you are using and how was the patient. But what I would say is that reasonable time is anything beyond 10 minutes is unreasonable time. And uh, if the equipment is not appropriate, then even sometimes two minutes is unreasonable, more than two minutes will be unreasonable time. So it depends on what sort of an equipment you have that the time will be decided, but don't prolong, don't prolong. And if the patient is desaturated once or twice, just come out. Failure to remove, very rarely you'll be required to do the thoracotomy. In my life, there was only one incidence where we could not remove the foreign body went into for a cot. Uh, otherwise, we could remove each and every foreign body, many of them infected ones. Uh, but uh, I, I would say that it should you should not take it as a sort of a challenge that you will take it out only and then only you will feel satisfied. It's a, it's a um, uh, sort of an ego issue. It should not be an ego issue at all. If you cannot remove the foreign body, it is not removable. 
hand it over to the chest surgeon. He will remove it. Flexible bronchoscopy can replace the uh, bronchoscopy uh, sometimes. So tracheostomy and foreign body aspiration we have already talked about. To summarize the fault, rigid bronchoscope, first line therapy for all suspected cases. An experienced team is preferable. Experience with the available equipment should be there. Whichever equipment is there with you, you should be experienced with that equipment. Not that you are experienced with some other equipment and you are performing bronchoscopy at some place where that equipment is not there. That means that, that, that there will be mismatch. So you should be experienced with the equipment with which you are familiar. And you should be using that equipment only. Ensure availability of appropriate size bronchoscope and forceps. A duplicate foreign body may help in planning appropriate instruments based on the type of foreign body. Check bronchoscopy after removal. Look for additional foreign bodies and residual foreign bodies should be done. This was the first photograph and you can see Gustav Killian performing the first rigid bronchoscopy. Look at the position. Look at the equipment. Look at the size of the equipment. The equipment doesn't look any day like this now. The position is never like this any, any day now. And just imagine how he would have done that bronchoscopy. The second photograph shows he being doing the bronchoscopy on a cadaver you know, in that position. And uh, this German gentleman, how he did the bronchoscopy in 1800s, later 1800s, salute to him. We today have got the best of the bronchoscope, best of the equipment, and it has become a very cool way of doing a bronchoscopy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mathur. Really, uh, words of wisdom there, uh, dealing very comprehensively the entire subject of uh, foreign bodies. Um, now, uh, I would request Prahlad to unmute uh, Dr. Yogesh, Dr. Deepak, Dr. Sohit, and also General Venktesh, if you can. Um, we are running short of uh, time by about 20, 30 minutes, so I request uh, the next speaker to stick within 20 minutes. Uh, but meanwhile, quick um, uh, comments from uh, Dr. Sohit. Very quick uh, comment because we go back to discussion. We have an open house towards the end of the session. Very quick words. Yeah, so I'll be pretty uh, to the point. That was a great talk, Dr. Mathur. That just speaks volumes uh, about your experience. Some of the points you made were, you can just uh, know them from uh, doing thousands of them. So uh, just a couple of things. Um, I know you presented some algorithms. Um, I think for uh, uh, an emergency situation, the safest bet, and this is what we are taught over here, and this is what we teach to our residents, is if either one of these, either your history, your clinical exam, or your x-ray is positive for a foreign body, you should go ahead and do a bronchoscopy. Because uh, in an emergency situation, it's always, it's, it's never easy to go through an algorithm. So if your history is positive, if your clinical exam is positive, or your x-ray shows some indication, because 40% of these x-rays will be normal. So you can have a normal x-ray, you can have just a choking episode. Uh, so you should do a bronchoscopy. You should have a very low threshold of doing a bronchoscopy. And secondly, is, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the equipment is the most important thing. And I always teach my residents is uh, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. So you have to prepare yourself. 90% of the times doing a bronchoscopy goes in preparation and the actual time is just 10%. So check your equipment. You are responsible for checking your equipment. Um, just a couple of points about CT scan because somebody had a question in the chat. Uh, the role of CT is very, very, very limited. The only time I would actually get a CT is if it's a missed foreign body on a bronchoscopy. The child has consolidation. You do a bronchoscopy. Uh, and you don't see a foreign body, then I would get a CT scan. I would never get a CT scan beforehand. And also the role of flexible bronchoscopy is very limited. Uh, never have a pulmonologist do a flexible bronchoscopy to remove a foreign body by itself. Even if he wants to do it, it should be done in the presence of an ENG because if he converts that bronchial foreign body into a tracheal foreign body, then he'll need an uh, ENG to do a tracheostomy to remove that foreign body. So, um, and always have a trach set available. Whenever you're doing these foreign bodies, it's always reasonable to have a tracheostomy set available. Um, there was another question about sizing. So Carl Stores actually produces three sets. One is for babies from zero to six months, and that actually has a 2.5 uh, 
uh, bronchoscope through which you can actually pass the 1.3 millimeter optical telescope. So they actually make an optical telescope for a 2.5 millimeter bronchoscope. It's super small. And hopefully you never have to deal with a six month old uh, foreign body in the bronchus. And then they have a child set from six months to three years and then six years and then six years onwards is an adult set. So there are sets available even for smaller, smaller uh, children. But yeah, that was awesome. That was just a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll quickly go to General Venkatesh. Uh, yeah. Uh, just quick comments before we go to the next lectures. I think we'll try to uh, save some time and then have the discussion a little later. My compliments to Dr. Mathur. Excellent presentation. Shows the experience and the range of foreign bodies that he has been able to remove. And I would concur most of it with uh, whatever has been said so far. And uh, again, I would uh, you know bring in a little focus on to the timing of bronchoscopy, which Dr. Mathur alluded to. If the child is sick, if the child is in distress, there's no time to waste. And again, uh, in such situation, in such an emergent situation, perhaps it is prudent for the most qualified anesthetist or the most experienced anesthetist and the most experienced ENT surgeon to do the scopy. And uh, you know, it is uh, often we have seen earlier days. Uh, Dr. Mathur alluded to it that we had the distal illuminating Cavalier Jackson bronchoscope with, uh, you know, incandescent light bulbs. You know, we were using almost losing a dozen of them before we actually removed the foreign body many times before we could introduce the scope. The, the bulbs used to fuse with a battery pack, which was in operation. Later on, we could convert most of them into fiber optic carriers. That was uh, much later in the mid 80s or early 90s. More importantly, and I would um, you know, concur with um, uh, uh, my previous speaker, it is important that you have a complete set of uh, bronchoscopic and equipment and forceps. And uh, as Dr. Mathur very clearly said, it will add to your knowledge before going, if you know, if you have a duplicate of the body that is available, that uh, the child is suspect to have uh, aspirated. So, more importantly, what is uh, clear is, especially in Indian context, when you have so many different types of toys available, it's quite possible that the same piece of a whistle or a toy will have multiple components and often uh, a transparent component is left behind. Therefore, it is very important that you do multiple check scopies before you actually say that, you know, you have successfully removed the, the pollen body. Uh, that's all I would like to say. Thank you. Uh, my apologies to Deepak and Yogesh. We'll just ask your comments after the next talk because we're running short of time. Without much ado, I'll request uh, Dr. Rakesh to start off on a very interesting topic of the instrumentation and the basic setup at a solo center. He's done wonderful work uh, in Lucknow uh, for years now and um, uh, let him share his experiences. Rakesh is no stranger to the Pediatric Airway Group. He's given a talk in the inaugural session itself. Rakesh, uh, stage is yours. And uh, before Rakesh starts, uh, we have a feedback uh, facility here because we want to tailor these programs to your needs and not what we want to put up on the show. So kindly the, um, uh, give the feedback whenever this link is shared with you. Kindly uh, fill it up and send it back to us. Rakesh. Yeah, good evening all and uh, good morning to our U.S. panelists. Uh, my job has been made easier by Professor uh, Mathur sir. But I'll just talk about uh, what are the troubleshooting we face during the time of instrumentation. What are the tricks of bronchoscopy? Uh, the safety of high flow uh, nasal cannula in airway surgery and especially in foreign bodies. What is my experience in last four years? A lesson learned with time. So I have almost a 12 to 15 year of experience of foreign bodies. Uh, not high volume load, but still uh, at least one or two cases on an average in a month. So uh, not going into the theoretical aspect of my lecture, I'll just go on what we are using as a for our airway cart and select few of the uh, things which are important. One is a flexible scope. We normally keep it on our airway trolley. Then various type of endotracheal tubes and microlaryngeal tube. Then IGEL, IMLA, the, the laryngeal mask airway, various laryngoscopes and blades like uh, Macintosh and Miller laryngoscopes. 
then uh, various connectors we use for uh, uh, doing uh, bronchoscopy with a, uh, a flexible scope and various other civil connectors and other things. These are very important because once you are examining the airway and once you are doing the foreign body and if you miss out any of these things, then you feel it like uh, you are nowhere. So uh, I'm not working in a solo center because it's a multi-speciality hospital, but most of the equipment has, are my investments. And that is, uh, I evolved it in uh, last uh, 15 to 20 years, I have a facility for 4K from Olympus and all the high-end equipments I have got. And beside this, we should have a Fogarty catheters. Uh, Sometimes it is a impacted foreign body, old foreign body, uh, inorganic foreign body, plastic foreign bodies in the distal part. So we need a Fogarty to pull up that foreign body out. Various types of uh, baskets are there. These baskets are available even with the uh, Eurosurgery experts also, and uh, they have a specific size which it will go into the uh, flexible uh, bronchoscope also. So, but the length is higher as compared to uh, the basket we get it from Olympus. So, this is a modification of our uh, laryngoscope lens saucer, which I use it for high flow nasal uh, cannula, which has got a few holes here. We have modified it again. We have made it four holes here on the the back side of the laryngoscope and two on either side of the laryngoscope. So once we are blocking the glottic, so till that we continue with the high flow nasal uh, cannula and most of the foreign bodies and most of the microlaryngeal work, posterior larynx work, we do it without the tube anesthesia. Beside the uh, uh, tower we have, we should have a recorder also. So I am using a black magic recorder. You can use any of your choice. And these are the few of the other equipments which you use it. So uh, Professor Mathur has already highlighted about stores ventilating bronchoscope. So one thing I would just like to emphasize here, there are optical forces and there are non-optical forces. So these are the forces you are grasping various types of foreign body. Another thing which I would like to say that the, the size uh, which are mentioned on the scope with the color coding is different for uh, the internal diameter of the scope. So we should have that airway card with it you know, on our mobile, uh, that uh, Cincinnati, that application of, we can use it uh, to measure the size of the bronchoscope, which will be using it. So uh, the size of the bronchoscope, it depends mainly about the uh, subglottic size of the airway. So the size 3.5 doesn't mean that it is an internal diameter of 3.5. The internal diameter is 4.9 or 5.7. You should remember that thing also. So these are the various forces Professor Mathur has already highlighted about. And this is our uh, publication on initial 16 cases of high flow nasal cannula, which has really a game changer in our airway surgery, and which we included two airway uh, foreign bodies with it. Now the figure has gone to eight cases and four we have done during this COVID time, all interesting cases. So what we do in high flow uh, nasal cannula, preoperative we nebulize like uh, with a decon, uh, the, the bronchodilator and budesonide, we head and with head and elevation of the patient in a stable patient. And we usually do the procedure with 10% xylocaine, use a uh, dexamethasone and we start with the intravenous fentanyl and slow in injection of propofol. And then we examine the airway and then we remove the foreign body. IV succinyl choline, we use it in a few of the cases that I will tell my own uh, series of patients which we have done it. Macintosh laryngoscope with optical force, we directly use it. We don't use a uh, rigid bronchoscope, the ventilating bronchoscope. In two cases, we have modified the optical force by fixing soft suction cannula stabilized with the two soft rubber bands at the distal end. So the tip of bronchoscope doesn't get dirty. And uh, this can also be used to deliver the oxygen. But in next two cases, we faced a problem. So we stopped using this. And because once a patient is spontaneously breathing or some movement is there, so there's a chance of thinking of this tube and the oxygen, which is present in the dead space using a high flow nasal cannula, 
it also start coming down. So we have changed it to initially four cases which we have sent it for publication. This is a three years with the average age of 20 months and average duration of presentation of foreign body was 7.2 days with every duration of procedure was 4.5 minutes. In one, none of the patient bag mass ventilation rigid bronchoscope was used and post-operative recovery was unhealthy. ABG was done 15 minutes after the procedure was within normal limit with PCO2 less than 45 millimeter of mercury. So this I'll show you the two patients I'll just show you the one on the right is uh, using a flexible bronchoscope and this was a very old foreign body that's a three year old impacted foreign body patient has a recurrent history of cough and uh, and it was embedded in the secondary bronchus and it was a, like a wheel plastic toy which a patient has inhaled and patient has a recurrent history and they finally after rec recurrent coughing problem then they got the CT scan and then they were able to see it. So in this image if you look at it there is a fibrous band which was just blocking the the impacted foreign body. So once I was trying to pull up with this forcep with a flexible scope and this procedure is just an edited one though it lasted for more than an hour and twice we have done the ABG and using a high flow nasal cannula and this case we discussed it with Dr. Anil Patel also where he's a person whom, with whom I have interacted a lot using a high flow and uh, he's a great influence on my use of and my anesthetist for using high flow nasal cannula. We were happy that he's giving his all the feedbacks on it. So this was the fibrous band, then we cut this fibrous band and taken out this tube. The second case, this one was, uh, it came out in a multiple piece and this patient was spontaneously breathing and finally we removed it within, and one by one it was got stuck in the subglottis and it's a very quick response. Shift it to the next. So it came out to be in seven pieces. So what high flow does it, 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 it improves my uh, the apnea time. And uh, for continuing for 15 uh, minutes, the uh, preoperative high flow, it gives a good enough time for me to continue it with it. This was a last week foreign body. This was a metallic foreign body for uh, on the right side, it was a hairpin impacted for six months. It was in the preoperative, it was on the right bronchus, but the next day when we posted this case after a COVID test, then we found this patient was having hemoptysis and it was in the left uh, main bronchus. So the, the important point was it was sitting at the carina, but the good part is it was the pin, the head of the pin was facing uh, proximally. So I could easily take out it, but twice it got impacted in the posterior uh, tracheal wall. So again, we, I pushed it down and then I took it out without damaging much of the posterior tracheal wall. And then they, we did the check. Uh, I'll just move it first. So it was in the left or main bronchus. And in this uh, left side, I was using a simple optical force without using it. I'll just highlight what is the advantage of using simple optical force without using it rigid bronchos, ventilating bronchoscope. So again, I left it down and then again, I picked it the tip of the foreign body. Then again, it got impacted. So again, I put it down and then lift it up. And this patient was also done with the high flow 
again got impacted. So I took it down and then and then I did the check bronchoscopy to look for any injury to the. So initially I used a rigid uh, this thing and then uh, used a soft suction cannula. 10 French calls to look for the any injury to the posterior. And then again, we got an X-ray neck to look for any emphysema for it. What are the advantage of high flow? Will It will remain effective as an instrumentation or not blocking the airway, while airway get blocked in cases where rigid bronchoscope was used. So uh, we continue with the oxygenation, better visualization of the airway, and one can easily move the patient head in right or left direction to visualize the particular side of the bronchus. Hypercarbia and respiratory acidosis chances will be less as airway is not completely blocked, as in case of rigid scope. So there should be a leak of 20 to 25 millimeter of mercury because air trapping should not be there with the if we are using a simple optical forceps without using a rigid bronchoscope. So planning is now finally what plan A, what we keep it in last four years, we do it under high flow, 10 to 15 minutes of high flow nasal cannula, inject propofol and fentanyl or remifentanyl spray. And the spray also we use a different technique. I'll just show you. Oropharynx and airway, we, we spray it. Examine airway with flexible scope at 2.2 because we found that 2.2 has got less irritation to the airway. And we look for the type, location, foreign body, cannulation, secretion in trachea and bronchi. So that we'll assess it whether we need a suction or not. Then we tell the anesthetist, and till that time we expose the airway, one person is holding the laryngoscope, and we are ready with it. And then we inject scolene as a half of the actual doses. And we half we keep it for the, if we require a further time. Plan B, we shift it to the ventilating bronchoscope, use optical forces and accessories like basket and balloon. And plan C is shift to a flexible scope, spontaneous breathing patient with a high flow or use a LMA. So LMA also, uh, I've been using it. And I found it, it is, uh, in a, especially in a child of more than five years of age, this is also a good option in a, in a uh, stable patient. So airway, uh, normally what we usually use is a uh, spray like this. This is a IV cannula and this here we fix the oxygen flow because oxygen acts as a jet and uh, we use a 4% xylocaine. It depends on the strength, uh, what we want to use, 1% and uh, four milligram per ml we use it. So 4% like this, what we use it for the balloon also. For vascular balloon, we one of the port, we use it for the for airway surgery. So one uh, port for the manometer, that is for injecting uh, saline, and other uh, port is for oxygenation, through which we can distally oxygenate the patient. So at a, at a depend on the tidal volume of the patient, age of the patient, the anesthetic decided to keep it at 0.5 liter per minute or we keep it at four liter per minute. That depends on the, and the third option we use it's a suction. So suction also here we using a triway cannula with one, uh, he's pushing the 4% xylocaine and uh, this is the oxygen port and oxygen port gives a thrust to the local anesthetic agent and it goes into the trachea. So whole other trachea get anesthetized. And this is another way which we are using with the LMA that is uh, attaching a uh, oxygen port through the flexible scope and uh, uh, transtracheal uh, oxygenation the airway. So this triway is very important, should keep two or three uh, triway with it ready for, and this is another, uh, this is an article from which it has been taken. This is a airway, uh, this triway is there. One is for the airway and one is for the suction. So uh, both the things can be done with the flexible uh, bronchoscope. And this is a study which has been done in All India Institute of Medical Sciences and uh, it has come as a letter to the editor. So lesson learned with time is if it's a stable baby, plan the surgery in the morning. You should have a consistent team, anesthetist and uh, your paramedical staff should be well versed with that. 
and we call it as a QRT, quick response team. Checklist, the surgeon, the status tray, and atropine should be loaded because bradycardia is one of the biggest uh, complication of bronchoscopy. All plans steady, troubleshooting should be checked, various connectors and camera monitor, everything has to be checked. Because even with the ventilating bronchoscope, sometimes we don't get a connector there. And uh, so we keep all the in a one box so that uh, immediately, if we plan it, within five minutes, we'll get everything ready. Suction pressure should not exceed. This is very important because we are using a high flow. And if you are using a high flow, we should avoid using a suction. So even for the normal bronchoscopy, the pressure, you should remember it because most of the suction machine, the central suction, it comes in millimeter of mercury. For neonate, it is less. And if really necessary, you should use it. And for flexible, we prefer these are the, our anesthetic choice, the ketamine plus propofol or propofol fentanyl. Sometimes we give it dexin propofol also. So lesson learned with time is oil seeds of organic foreign body, hold it gently, do not apply too much pressure. Granulations tissue or trauma due to previous attempts, use a 2% xylopin granulin spray and lower the, lower the pressure of the suction. Fogarty balloon are useful adjuncts. Adjustment placement of ventilating bronchoscope in trachea or bronchus is important because you will be manipulating on right or left side. So you should be aware that where your rigid bronchoscope is located, whether it's in mid, mid trachea or it is in distal trachea because maneuverability of the, your digital, the, your uh, forcep, the optical forcep will depend on the position of your bronchoscope. Sometimes tilting the babies, Professor Mathur already described it, visualization of secondary tertiary bronchus while using ventilating bronchoscope. Another addition which I have done for digestive foreign body, which I would like to share it. Uh, these are the, so denture we use uh, laser because that time we were short because our shear force has been damaged. So I am using a diode laser to cut a uh, denture, old denture impacted so that we can take out the, so if you are working with a Eurosurgeon, you can use a Holmium laser because Holmium, they are using it quite often. So break it into two, you can just burn it and it will be then easier to take out with the uh, forcep. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Rakesh. Uh, that was very, again, a wonderful talk. And I think we deserve another talk from you on HFNC when we go into anesthesia, uh, talk on anesthesia. I think we'll bring you in again because that's a separate topic on its own. But thank you very much for introducing us into this particular subject. And I'm uh, happy to tell you that we have uh, almost 185 participants from almost 18 countries. So we're having a good response. Um, so uh, it more... Uh, responsibility on us as faculty and as uh, um, uh, panelists and uh, uh, experts to give the right thing that we need uh, to give the audience. So what we have to do is uh, kindly um, do fill up the feedback forms so that we can tailor these programs to your needs. And uh, Dr. Shashidhar has helped me put this program together. I'm thankful to him. I'm also thankful to Dr. Prahlad. And I quickly introduce Dr. Yogesh. Uh, Nyopane from uh, uh, Associate Professor from the Tribhuvan University from Nepal, um, Kathmandu. Uh, welcome, Dr. Yogesh, and Hello, uh, quick Thank comments you, from you. Uh, sir, actually, it was an excellent presentation from Dr. Mathur and Dr. Rakesh. Uh, Dr. Mathur has been our teachers, and uh, we know Dr. Rakesh from so long. So I just have to comment on a few things. The role of the physiotherapy after uh, removing the foreign body, especially when you try to remove the peanuts, which are most common foreign bodies in our part of the world. So when you grab the peanuts, uh, we can uh, sometimes it is not, uh, we're not able to remove all of the peanuts, it break into the pieces. So from our experience, what we feel is that if we cannot remove whole of the peanut, and sometimes we still think there are some pieces of the peanuts left in the tertiary bronchioles, then the physiotherapy in those circumstances will help a lot. And uh, we have some experience of using uh, only the optical forceps uh, with the laryngoscope, especially in the child which are more than two to three, uh, less than two to three months of the years. 
And in those cases, you are using a simple laryngoscope and using the optical forceps uh, will be very easy to remove the foreign body because we cannot pass those optical uh, forceps through a size of the bronchoscope, which is about 2.5. And we don't have that luxury of, of having 1.5 millimeter optical uh, forceps. Uh, so I can comment on those two things. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, instrumentation is not widely available. At most places, we are working under difficult conditions. Anesthetic support may not be very great. And now we uh, request Dr. Deepak, uh, if you can unmute yourself. Uh, can you unmute Dr. Deepak, please? Pralad? Yes, sir. One minute. Uh, Dr. Deepak, uh, is, uh, I see three names. Deepak, uh, you should be recognizing him. He's, uh, <laughs> he's waving his hand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Deepak has been one of the pillars of our airway program, which we've been conducting for many years. Uh, he's an extremely experienced um, uh, otolaryngologist, uh, director of the Aerodigestive Center in the Children's Hospital in uh, uh, Houston, uh, Texas. And um, uh, he's contributed to all our uh, uh, you know, uh, educational programs. Thank you, Deepak, and glad to have you here. Your comments, please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Excellent talks. I, I'll just add a few things. Um, just we are reiterating some important points. Number one, um, when you preparing for an airway, airway foreign body, I would divide them into three parts. Someone who needs that. Compromising airway, things are going bad. You don't need anything else. You need to do a bronx stat. Wherever your equipment is, you should be doing it. The second one is a stable patient, but there is a high suspicion. Those ones you can get an x-ray, you can assess and all that. And the third group is chronic airway. So you need to divide them into those three categories and do things accordingly. The second thing is whenever you're going for a foreign body removal, you personally should go and check the equipment. Be prepared to make sure your equipment is working fine. Because once you're in the airway, you can't be looking around to say, do I have this or not? So being over prepared in these situations is not bad. Have everything set up. Make sure your optical forceps is all set up. Your forceps is going in. Whatever forceps you're planning to use, all that is there. It's very important. The third thing would be whenever you're taking a foreign body with a ventilating bronchoscope, we were talking about for losing the foreign body, losing it at the glottic level. The best way to take it out is once you grasp the foreign body, retrieve it into the bronchoscope so that the foreign body is within the bronchoscope. Uh, occasionally, it is not possible because the foreign body is too big, but majority of times, it, you might be able to get it within the bronchoscope. If you can get it, you should get it into it and then take the whole thing out as a single unit. That way, you will avoid damage to uh, surrounding structures and avoid losing the foreign body. There are occasional situations where, say, you go in and you see a tracheal foreign body, Sometimes you might have to push that foreign body into a bronchus. I'm talking about special situations where the kid is crashing, things are going down, and the foreign body is in the airway. Use your rigid bronchoscope to just push it into the bronchus. That way you can ventilate for a little bit, and you can put your thoughts together, and you can go back and retrieve it. That's it from me. Yeah, thank you very much, Deepak, for your comments. Um, now, uh, since we are short of time, we'll go straight to Dr. Jayaprakash Reddy from uh, Karnal. He is uh, a senior ENT specialist in the Sai ENT Hospital. Enormous experience. He's got a large hinterland. I think uh, people come from all over the area around his town. Um, he serves the whole, uh, they're all referred to him, and he's got very rich experience. And I request Dr. Jayaprakash Reddy to um, quickly start his talk. And if possible, make it as concise as possible so, so that we have more time for discussion. Can you please unmute Dr. Jayaprakash Reddy, please? Yeah, he has to unmute himself. Jayaprakash, share your presentation, please. The title of his talk is Difficult Situations in Airway Foreign Body Retrieval in Children. Jayaprakash? Yeah, he's done it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah, good evening. Uh, 
Are you able to see my slide? Yes, yes, we can see it. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the previous speakers have made my job very easy, and there are the excellent uh, tips given by Mathur sir and the innovative things shown by Dr. Rakesh Sivastav sir. And now I just want to share my experience of managing tracheobronchial foreign bodies in a solo center. Even though I have worked in a government medical college for a period of 10 years, I have managed about 100 patients there in my tenure there. Once I started my practice as a solo ENT surgeon, uh, I did the, uh, around 1,450 cases of uh, foreign body removal in my own center as a solo practitioner. So I would like to share my experiences of uh, difficult cases that I have managed over a period of 20 years. And I proudly say that I am one of the product of this uh, hospital where I studied my post-graduation in Bangalore, where I study, I learned ABCDs of bronchoscopy. So during our time, every uh, serving soldier or the family who comes to our hospital with a cough has to be uh, ruled out uh, with a tuberculosis. And we had a chest physician in our hospital and we had a flexible bronchoscopy in our uh, OP itself. But when it went wrong, so we have to do for all the patients rigid bronchoscopy for about six months time before uh, the flexible bronchoscopy gets repaired. So that is the time that I picked up the bronchoscopy uh, in a normal patients, uh, elderly patients we used to do bronchoscopy to collect the tracheobronchial secretions for the studies. So I cannot forget my alma mater where I learned uh, ABCDs. So this is my experience and I want to share my experience uh, difficult cases. We all know that uh, uh, pediatric bronchoscopy is really difficult and challenging because of these reasons. I don't want to go into the theory, but I just want to stress here that there is always a delay in diagnosis before the patient reaches the uh, actual place where it can be removed. Uh, it is due to parental negligence and it is misdiagnosed by our own colleagues and it is treated as asthma or tuberculosis and it is most of the times it is lack of suspicion on the part of clinician and even in spite of uh, patients uh, parents giving the correct history it is uh, we that do undue procrastination on the part of doctor that would lead to the patient coming from uh, for off, uh, inhalation of foreign body they take more time to come to the real place where it can be removed as our previous speaker said rightly we need to if you uh, can prepare two hours to prepare for a bronchoscopy, it really takes two minutes to remove the foreign body. But on the contrary, if you take two minutes to prepare, it will definitely take two hours to remove the foreign body and it will be a disaster in the operation room. So what is the uh, uh, patient for a uh, uh, bronchoscopy? It's a child, it's a real challenge because the child has a very small, uh, narrow subglottis and trachea and the right main and left main bronchus. So it's always a challenge. And majority of our foreign bodies are not radiopic. So this would put the private practitioners in the, so as a private practitioner, uh, I have to uh, counsel the parents that a small child who comes with a chronic cough, who is not in a real emergency, is becomes a big task for me to counsel the parents when there is no foreign body seen on an X-ray. The X-ray is reported as normal, then it is very difficult to convince the parents. Then when it is non-emergency, especially it will be difficult for them to, unless we have a CT scan with us. Then once a patient is referred to us for a bronchoscopy, we have to uh, exclude the medical causes, which are they like acute laryngotracheal bronchitis, is confused with the uh, foreign body and they'll be referred to us for to rule out a foreign body. An enthusiastic youngster who started his career uh, uh, in early days, they will be jumping and doing a bronchoscopy and it will be disastrous in the post-operative period. Already, already the uh, compromised airway. So we need to exclude medical causes by a careful history. And most of the times, it is the consent that how you take and it is the outcome, how do you explain to the parents matters the most in the pre-operative period. We need to gain the confidence of the parents and we need to counsel them along with the anesthetist. In my practice, what I do, once I suspect a foreign body and I make the things ready for the bronchoscopy, I talk to the parents, however, however uh, illiterate they are in their own language with our own, with our anesthetist by the side. So we explain the procedure 
and then only we go in and do the bronchoscopy. So these are the mechanical problems. The difficulties are due to the mechanical problems like metallic uh, endoscope itself and the instrument that is being used and the living tissue that is surrounding the foreign body and the foreign body itself. If you address this, if you understand the mechanics of these things, it will be like a child's play to remove the foreign body. See now, this is a foreign body that is stuck in the trachea and it is in the horizontal plane and it can be, it is removed very easily without any problem with an optical forceps. But it is not the case in all the time. See, the, the forceps that is designed by the stores is in the horizontal plane. So we need to turn the optical forceps all around and then hold the foreign body. See, here I am unable to remove the foreign body as a whole because I am unable to hold the foreign, hold the foreign body more than 50%. That is called as equator of the foreign body. If I can hold the foreign body of more than 50%, that is beyond the equator of the foreign body, I will remove the foreign body as a whole for sure. So now here I am taking a chance again. So this is the problem with the optical forceps. Optical forceps that is designed and named as a peanut grasper is not a peanut grasper as Dr. Indian Mathur rightly said. This is a difficult forceps to use. And then this is the, once we remove the foreign body, then we do the check bronchoscopy. So this is the uh, foreign body that can be removed very comfortably with the optical forceps. So let's see some of the difficult cases that we see. So now, this is the patient who came to me from uh, uh, four hours distance, uh, traveled all the way, and this foreign body is just stuck in between the vocal cord, and the patient has a severe uh, respiratory distress and a noisy breathing. So now you can see the patient, uh, I'm sorry, I'll just go back to the previous slide. Yeah, see now in this scenario, we cannot uh, ventilate nor you can intubate. So we need to be very quick in removal. See how I removed is that. See what I did, I just, anesthetist is showing the cards to me with the Macintosh. So with my left hand, I'm holding the zero, uh, 4 mm nasal endoscope with a HD camera and I'm looking at the glottis and my right hand, I'm using the front foreign body grasping forcep and I'm removing the foreign body. The rule of thumb is that never put your forceps into the trachea without a sheath. I knew very well, but in this scenario, I have to do this maneuver. Otherwise, I will, uh, if I introduce the bronchoscope into the uh, glottis, I'll be uh, successfully throwing the foreign body down and it will be more difficult. So now this is a unique foreign body. You can see this is a blouse hook, which is got stuck at the anterior commissure. Again, not can't ventilate and not intubate. So now we were planning to do a tracheostomy in this patient, but I could do uh, without the same technique I'm using here, but I was unable to manipulate uh, because the cards were moving and uh, the patient was coming out. We cannot make the patient uh, into under too much of anesthesia. So that's why I uh, removed my uh, telescope and endoscope and I used a conventional uh, DL scopy and then I could remove the foreign body, which I could not record in the emergency. So now this patient, you can see there is some necrotic tissue sitting in the glottis. So this patient actually came to me with a history of hoarseness of voice and some noisy breathing. And then when I see a video laryngoscopy in my outpatient department, then I, I see a necrotic tissue, which, mim which was mimicking like a carcinoma. And uh, uh, they said that uh, they will come back later uh, for the further investigations and they went home. So after about 10 days time, he came and told that his dentures were missing. Then I felt that the dentures might got uh, impacted here instead of uh, me suspecting the carcinoma. Then I thought the dentures are, uh, got infect, uh, impacted in the glottis. So now then I uh, did a, uh, you see carefully here, it is looking like a necrotic tissue if the history is not given. So then when he gave the history of missing dentures, so I could see that the, these are the dentures. Then I went inside and I removed with the left hand uh, endoscope and uh, camera and uh, anesthetist showing the glottis and I could remove the foreign body. And then again, and it, uh, this is the uh, uh, photograph of the same thing. Uh, yeah, this is a, a square uh, import, uh, very uh, interesting uh, foreign body in a child. 
you can see this is a uh, square shaped plastic uh, foreign body which is aspirated so there is a difficulty in ventilation instrumentation and the driver all three problems at once you can see now this is the foreign body just in the subglottis and partly into the glottis so now so how do we remove this this is a bigger one gone inside so now either we have to make it into uh, two or three pieces or uh, uh, let's see how I, you see without uh, introducing the bronchoscope again i tried with the uh, telescope uh, forceps you can see it is a quite big one to retrieve it and i am trying my level best without damaging the mucosa see now it has gone inside so now i know how much it is so i know that putting a, a forceps into the tracheobronchial foreign body without sheath is not correct but still i am trying my level best and i am i know that i cannot remove this without a sheath so now i abandoned this and then i went inside now you can see I, I put a ventilating bronchoscope using the sheath and I brought the foreign body against the mouth of the sheath and you please watch how instrumentation is done. This is very important than the uh, words. You see now I introduced the, the bronchoscope and now you see once I held the foreign body, see now my left hand, see. Once I know that I brought the foreign body near the till the mouth of the uh, bronchoscope. See, my two fingers on the left side will hold the foreign body. This is very important to stabilize the foreign body against the mouth of the uh, bronchoscope, so I can remove the foreign body now comfortably. So this was one of the difficulties, and this is the foreign body that was removed. And now see this child. The six years old child or eight years old child seems to be severe breathlessness in the tracheal foreign body. You can see, you can see the saturation was around 80. I rushed inside in some other, some other hospital uh, other than where I operate. So it was an emergency. I had to counsel the parents in one minute and I went inside. My foreign, my anesthetist was there on time and we could remove the foreign body uh, within a few minutes time. And uh, this is one of the uh, patient uh, where we operated. Uh, this is a bilateral uh, foreign body. You can see bilateral uh, x-ray, x -ray, you can see emphysema. And it is difficult to diagnose because you cannot compare the other one side because both the sides, uh, the reduced uh, air entry is there. And one needs to be vigilant about the beware of the silent chest. This is one of the most imp uh, emergency that I have come across in my entire scenario. So we need to be experienced people around, including the OT staff. We can't take much time in this type of scenario. And we will be very fast in grasping out the foreign body. And in this patient, I tried to use the telescopic forceps, but since it was taking more time, documenting this patient is more important, more not very important than saving the life. You see, this patient is a one and a half years old child with a multiple foreign bodies, three foreign bodies in a single child. One in trachea, see now, one in the trachea and the two in the trachea bronchial. This is see the breathing of the child. So now I cannot use the ventilating bronchoscope. There was no time to me. I use the conventional uh, for instruments. See, I'm trying to document this patient, uh, removal of this tracheal foreign body, but my anesthetist said there's no time. Please don't do all these things. So I use the conventional uh, uh, Kalilkar instruments, the bronchoscopy uh, instruments, and I removed all the foreign bodies in one and a half minutes time or something like that, so the child become all right. So this patient has come to me with the history of uh, uh, a confirmed uh, diagnosis of a foreign body from a distance place that reached at 2 p.m. And this was diagnosed by a pediatrician. You can see the pre-op saturations are falling like this. Now my anesthetist came on time. It was about 2.30 in the midnight. I operated this patient in a pediatric hospital and uh, there was no time for me to record how I did. So this is after foreign body removal. You can see the patient uh, comfortably lying down and the room air, you can see the patient is having 100% saturation. So this is, these are the patients that we need to be uh, careful about and we have to act in time. So now, this is a, a one more foreign body. You can see lying down in a uh, plane which is not favorable for removal. So we have to do a version 
that see you can see the patient is having severe respiratory distress here same patient see what i am doing i am rotating the foreign body like this and i am holding the this is a conventional instrument i used to remove the foreign body this takes very less time for me to use uh, than the ventilating bronchoscope in this type of uh, patients i take very less time so that so this is how you must bring the foreign body towards the tip of the mouth and then extract the foreign body along with the sheath and the forceps as a single unit yeah this was a very very difficult uh, low, very small child with a very low saturation and it is a betel nut and i'll tell you betel nut the, which are having chemicals uh, flavored betel nut powder is one of the most difficult foreign body for the patient uh, because it induces lot of bronchorrhea and uh, severe congestion and uh, it is very easy foreign body for the uh, surgeon so that you can grasp the foreign body very fast but it doesn't uh, break into pieces so i i, I removed the betel nut in a small child and the foreign and the saturation improved like that and this was the one of the nightmare for me where the saturations before i could go in the saturations were falling so you can see the foreign body is in the trachea with a lot of secretions here and the patient anesthetist you can see the foreign body and the anesthetist was unable to ventilate the patient we intubated the patient for a while and then we brought the saturations up and then we removed the foreign body so this was the scenario you can see the foreign body uh, saturations are falling down like this in a solo practice um, uh, in a private practice you can imagine my pulse will be going around 200 or so and that is the reason i think i developed hypertension at a very young age of 37 years i developed hypertension managing this kind of patients and see the saturations are falling and you should be very very quick in removing the such foreign bodies or you ask the anesthetist to intubate again and uh, uh, remove the foreign body see that is a foreign body that are removed very quickly and you can see the saturations going up without any uh, oxygen at 100 uh, uh, this one so this was operated in uh, 2018 or something like yeah 2015 yeah so that's it yeah this is again a 3 months old child where uh, the there's a nail in the trachea and it was there for about 15 days or so and uh, i removed uh, this nail you can see there is a nail yeah this patient i operated in a pediatric hospital where we have only single chip camera at that time and this was analog uh, uh, this one was there so we removed the foreign body uh, this one very comfortably with the conventional instruments and uh, this was a very rare anomaly that i wanted to share with you this was a easy foreign body for me to remove this was a metallic foreign body a zip cover zip uh, handle in the trachea and once i remove this foreign body i found this rare anomaly as a pig bronchus or tracheal bronchus you can see this is the carina left main and right main bronchus is a very rare anomaly i come across just to share with you all that there is a condition like this is called as a tracheal bronchus and there is nothing significant about that sometimes the foreign body you may you may this this can be confused for the carina if you carefully see this uh, you can note that this is a, a very rare anomaly this called as a pig bronchus or a tracheal bronchus this is the carina is a very rare anomaly i found this in the uh, one of the patients just to share with you that and this is again a hook that is in the uh, right main bronchus sometimes when you try to remove this hook it, this part may get stuck at the anterior commissure so we need to be careful about that and this is one of the uh, foreign body uh, where the, this foreign body i cannot forget because one of my friend tried to do this foreign body uh, extraction by bronchoscopy uh, he has tried about for about uh, one and a half hours or so and uh, i cannot forget this day because that that was a very hottest day of uh, it was in the peak summer there was no power and it was about 10 30 in the night I was about to go home he called me so i took all my instruments and gone to the hospital i tried on three occasions to remove the foreign body thoroughly but i could not remove is a very big chunk of uh, uh, very big chunk of uh, betel nut raw betel nut so i did a tracheostomy and uh, removed to foreign body this was the only patient where i had to do tracheostomy and i just decanulated this patient after two days uh, time when patient is doing well and this is uh, see this was a uh, when i 
put a telesee, what I do is in all suspected uh, foreign body patients, what I do is that uh, my anesthetist will hyperventilate the patient and give me, I'll take the uh, 4 mm nasal endoscope uh, and uh, I hold the Macintosh in my left hand. And once I introduce the uh, uh, nasal endoscope into the trachea, so this is what I see. I study the position of the foreign body. I know there is a uh, foreign body in the right main bronchus removed but the saturations were not improving. If you see carefully from the beginning, I want to show, see, there is a foreign body here, and see there is a streak of secretions coming from the left main bronchus, which were ignored by me. Uh, as I see this, I know this is the only foreign body. I know that, I removed that after that. Again, uh, there is a habit of uh, rechecking once I remove, even though my anesthetist says that don't see. So I again take time to put the same endoscope into the tracheobronchial tray. To my surprise, I see a second different foreign body. This was a, a, a peanut on the right side, and you can see a dal seed in the left side. You can see very clearly the color of the foreign body. You can see there's a dal seed stuckly sitting in the lower lobe. So I removed with the so the lesson learned was to do, once you remove the foreign body, please, please always do check bronchoscopy to rule out a second bronchoscopy, which is possibly there in many of the times. So this, is, this was the uh, patient who was referred to me by a pediatrician uh, that the patient has developed acute uh, uh, severe uh, uh, respiratory distress, uh, needs, uh, one minute, needs a bronchoscopy uh, evaluation and the patient came to me at a I called the anesthetist even though there was no history of choking there was a history of sudden onset of respiratory distress so this was the patient having severe respiratory distress so then what I did again I took the 4mm endoscope I gone inside and I see here you can see that the trachea is pushed from posterior side and I cannot pass my 4mm uh, nasal endoscope into the trachea beyond this point. So I suspected some mediastinal problem and I came out and the patient had severe respiratory distress for the simple maneuver post-operatively and the patient was intubated and patient was kept on ventilator for a day and we reviewed the patient uh, from the ventilator. You can see the something pushed from behind. You can see my 4mm scope cannot go inside. So if I pass a bronchoscope into this, I could have negotiated this area, but I would have missed this finding. So the most important thing is prior you pass a sheet, you pass a telescope and study the trachea. That is a uh, hint, that is a, uh, uh, this one I can give you. So post-operatively, we did a uh, scan for this patient, which would have done pre-operatively, but in our practice, we don't do CT scan. For all the patients, you can see the patient has a mediastinal tumor here, the narrowed uh, lumen here. So that is the reason that the trachea was pushed anteriorly. And this patient went on to uh, the thoracic surgeon and he was operated. So the lesson learned is you do a bronchoscopy preoperatively in all patients, but still I don't do it in my practice for various other reasons unless I have a compelling reasons to do so. So now, always, so see now again, See, you take 10 4mm scope and then study the uh, foreign body like this. Note the position of the foreign body. This is called the presentation of the foreign body. As Dr. Indian Mathur said it rightly, the position of the foreign body that is there is the best position to remove it. We as the surgeons grasp it, then push it, pull it, and then change its favorable position into an unfavorable position. So once you pass your telescope, you study the foreign body and how you have to extract the plan of action, what forceps have to be used and re-examine again. This is what I do. So, uh, yeah, see now, when the patient has a suspected uh, foreign body, so what we do is that, I'm sorry, let's go back. Yeah, see, the anesthetist will show the cards like this and now I introduce my telescope into the tracheobronchial tree and I pass this into the trachea and see the uh, entire tracheobronchial tree. If there is no foreign body, there is no need to put the bronchoscope sheet inside. This is like a child's play. Just put the nasal endoscope into the tracheobronchial tree, which will reach up to here. 
so there is no need for us to it will take just a matter of uh, 30 seconds to inspect the tracheobronchial tree so this is a difficult patient where the foreign body was buried four months uh, uh, after the foreign body in the uh, aspiration the child came it was a lower lobe of the left side which is very difficult to remove and there are a lot of granulations as you see here which were bleeding like anything so i took time to suck around the, all the blood and uh, in this type of scenario you cannot use the uh, trach uh, optical forceps uh, conventional forceps as dr mathur sir rightly said you pass the telescope like this see the foreign body whether it is removed completely or no and then you again use the forceps tactile sensation and uh, remove the foreign body so this is how you need to extract the foreign body in a difficult situations like this but please don't try to do for bronchoscopy for more than say 5 to 10 minutes time if you cannot do uh, extract the foreign body then you postpone it you yourself can do at a later stage maybe tomorrow or after tomorrow or a good antibiotic cover or with uh, nebulizations other things but don't try to overdo more than 10 to 15 minutes time and this is the very interesting foreign body you can see a metallic foreign body again i put the nasal endoscope and i studied that it was impacted in the uh, right main bronchus this was i tried with the forceps it was slipping is a metallic one but what with the luckily when i put a suction it, i removed that with the suction i brought it into the uh, uh, bronchoscope and i could remove it very easily which was otherwise would have been a very difficult foreign body and this was one of the difficult foreign bodies even though is a uh, uh, 50 years old man the long standing uh, foreign body a piece of uh, goa fruit which was stuck in the uh, left main bronchus and he was a hypertensive and post cabg patient so i removed this foreign body uh, uh, in an adult like this the conventional instruments you can see this uh, piece of uh, goa which was lying down for a very long time so sometimes we do get adults i removed about 10 15 patients and this is a bunch of uh, uh, left main bronchus you can see uh, it was there the difficulty with this is that if you make it into two three pieces it will be difficult for you to uh, remove one by one you need to extract them uh, all together so you can see now how i do so i see anesthetist is showing like this i pass telescope along with the hd then uh, camera and see the foreign body presentation like this and i also have a very good uh, recording system that's ida system and i record all my uh, surgeries and see you can see uh, how i am using a ventilating bronchoscope turning the head of the patient and removing the foreign body as a, a whole with the along with the scope so this is one of the patients where i could not remove the foreign body and actually this patient had a foreign body here which was successfully driven to here by somebody else and they came to me when 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 it got impacted here already they did a tracheostomy so i removed the tracheostomy uh, tube and i did a peroral uh, bronchoscopy but i could not remove this foreign body uh, so on two occasions i posted this patient and i referred to a place where uh, experienced people are there and uh, they tried on uh, several occasions but they could not remove finally uh, it has to be removed by thoracotomy by a thoracic surgeon so this was the only foreign body which was referred to the higher centers so with this uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen i just want to uh, conclude the, that foreign body removal from the tracheobronchial tree is an art and we need to learn and understand the science behind it and we need to anticipate the difficulties and be ready to manage them please don't do bronchoscopy unless it's an emergency if the patient has a foreign body in the tracheobronchial tree for 3 months and they came come at night yes the parents will be very anxious uh, after they reach the doctor before that they will be very casual but don't take it very seriously and do it at the night and get into problems but unless for compelling reasons that the patient has very low saturation so you categorize the your foreign body cases into real emergency then you do it otherwise don't do unless somebody pesters you to do in the late night and if the patient is febrile without cough without history of foreign body ingestion please think twice before you put your scope inside please remove, uh, rule out medical problems discuss with, discuss the same with the pediatric colleagues and sometimes the foreign body is stuck at very low level very very small foreign body with no uh, forceps space please abandon 
usually it comes out in the secretions in the chest uh, physiotherapy as my friend dr yogesh uh, told from nepal he told uh, this uh, chest physiotherapy or, or otherwise uh, see when in, on several occasions there are uh, incidences that i had to i could not remove the forehead body as a whole so i explained the parents uh, legibly that and i no, i make a note in the discharge summary and i do the after maybe if the child has symptoms i repeat bronchoscopy and i do free of cost because i am working in a private sector it's my own center i can do free of cost and i remove foreign body and second time also and if you cannot remove the foreign body abandon so hello your ego as dr mathur sir gave very very good tips and i am thankful to him that he, i learned a very lot of things today from dr mathur sir and send the patient to a proper place where the right job is done after all we are all doctors we should not harm the patient do no harm this is a very important thing and careful planning good instruments must have experience and preparation always the outcome is better so learn from our own mistake and from others common sense experience and last but not the least advice from seniors see whenever i get a patient from uh, 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 when i do a difficult foreign body uh, i call seniors to take advice i have very good uh, senior uh, next to my where i practice dr srinath he practices in a place uh, nearby he is the one pioneer uh, in our area who started uh, bronchoscopy from uh, he has done more cases than me probably and uh, he is very much experienced he is uh, uh, advices were invaluable for me i thank dr sinath also i think he is joined this session so with all this uh, you can have a safe uh, foreign body removal uh, thank you very much for your kind attention and i thank uh, dr prahlad for conducting such a beautiful uh, and informative webinars and i thank dr rivi raman for his nice uh, uh, moderation thank you very much any questions i can take thank you sir Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jay Prakash Reddy. I think we have to leave the questions a little late because we have Dr. Uh, Vidya Sagar waiting in the wings, and then we'll have a discussion in the, both the topics. But excellent presentation! You've actually left us speechless. I'm sure if I ask the panel what to say, they'll probably say uh, the same thing that it was a wonderful collection, a wonderful documentation, and a lot of good advice to the young doctors. Um, can I request Dr. Vidya Sagar to get ready quickly and? Uh, we will uh, meanwhile there's a subterranean uh, conversation going on that is the chats which is going on and the experts are answering some of the questions and i'm sure there's a lot of questions to be answered so that with enough time dr vidya sagar you can go ahead dr vidya sagar is another uh, um, uh, pioneer in his area uh, that is uh, laryngology sleep and um, uh, pediatric care way also and uh, he uh, has an excellent collection wonderful experience and he is also from the from vijayawada and uh, let him share his experiences good evening everyone uh, am i audible sir Hello. yeah perfect okay am I, my slides are in yeah yeah thank you sir i doubt sir i want to thank uh, dr e v raman sir for organizing this wonderful wonderful uh, series of webinar dr prahlad our international faculties my seniors the excellent presenters who made my job so easy i learned a lot more than uh, i am going to give uh, tips or anything actually um, without further ado i would go into the topic my topic that was given was untold secrets in airway foreign bodies and i am dr vidya sagar from vijayawada so let me i'll be giving more of uh, uh, suggestions from the experience that i have gained in over the years more from the seniors as well um as dr mathu said the improved instrumentation that we have obtained now has totally revolutionized the uh, airway foreign body uh, that was once feared into a, a kind of a easier one nowadays the first and foremost tip that i would want to give my juniors or the new beginners or novice surgeons is as reiterated by uh, dr mathur and my previous speakers and uh, international faculty that we need to know about our instrument armamentarium first that is the number one thing we need to know whether it works or not we have to make sure the assembly is right before we start it and more importantly we need to have assisted this procedure or even participated 
in these uh, uh, workshops, if possible, if you can. This is one of uh, uh, the learning uh, series that we have already published in YouTube. Hello. Yeah. So already we have published in the YouTube. And the links are, and the links are already available. Uh, you can take a snapshot of these two links and this will tell both the parts of the uh, uh, bronchoscopes as well as its use in the animal uh, models like this. So we have conducted many um, workshops, both in the sheep cadavers as well as in the mannequins. And we have uh, put this video presentation in the YouTube and the YouTube link is as mentioned here. You can go through these two links and you would be able to uh, learn across the parts of various parts of the bronchoscopes and what is the use of them and what is the prism, what is it and what are the ports and what is the ventilating port, what is the laser port and what is the eyepiece, how do we uh, attach the optical forceps, every detail is in these two videos. So if you need to know uh, more, you can just go through these uh, two YouTube links, you can take a pic of uh, these two. Uh, snapshot of this and then you can uh, see the videos later. So now, uh, as I reiterated before, you try it on a, a cadaver or on a sheep or on a mannequin before you actually try these instruments on a patient. So that is the tip number one. So the next most important tip is when you're trying to remove the foreign body from the uh, bronchus, you need to have a gap between the bronchoscope as well as the forceps so that the optical forceps opens it. See here, the NOAA surgeon was trying to insert the bronchoscope under obviously my supervision, but he was trying to open the optical forceps without much of a gap between the bronchoscope and the lumen. So that should not be done. The ideal thing that should be done is there should be a little bit of gap between the foreign body and the sheath or the bronchoscope. And that's when you're going to grasp it. So, tip number two, a tracheal, bronco, uh, tracheal or a glottic foreign body, your reflexes have to be quick. You have to remove quickly or you have to take one of the, these bronchoscope, I mean the foreign bodies to one of the bronchi, preferably the right bronchi. And after that, when you hold it, your hold should be firm, but it should not be too tight to break it. Breakage both to the foreign body as well as to the forceps also. There are instances wherein the surgeon has applied enormous force over the foreign body and even the forceps has broken in and it becomes even a mess that we have to now remove the foreign body forceps that has broken and also the foreign body that is left in situ. And the third thing is the maximum grip on the foreign body has to be held when it is coming out of the subglottis region. Because you know that in the neonatus or the infants, the subglottis is the narrowest portion rather than the glottis per se. So since Dr. JP has reiterated the uh, glottic foreign bodies and uh, the foreign bodies, wherein your reflexes has to be real. This is another uh, foreign body just in the uh, glottis. We don't have time even to record or to pass a sheath. Your reflexes has to be very quick and you have to just concentrate on removing this. The next instance that I had mentioned is that this foreign body that is in the trachea, if it is possible, it has to be pushed into the bronchi, preferably into the a right main bronchi. Here it happened to be a tamarind seed and this has been in the right main bronchi. As you know, the tamarind seed has a peculiar shape and because of its um, hardness and the belly shape, there is a chance of the slip, slipping of this foreign body. And if your grip is not good, like how it is shown here, if your grip is not good, then there is a every possibility that this foreign body may slip off as you're bringing it towards the subglottic trachea and that it could be a 
problem. See here, you are trying to bring it, and at the subgirders, it slips off because the grip is not adequate. So, as I had mentioned before, oops, sorry. Am I there? Hello? Screen now. Hello. Are you trying to draw something, uh, Dr. Vidyasagar? No, sir. I don't know what happened suddenly. Uh, Reshare it. Reshare it. Share the screen. Okay, sir. Just a minute. Just a minute, sir. No, no, take your time. No problem. See, in view of the importance of the topic and presence of such a distinguished faculty, uh, if all the faculty agree, we can extend uh, the meeting for another 15, 20 minutes or half an hour also. Uh, it is at the discretion of the moderator and the faculty. Yeah. Prahlad, I warned you on the first day. I'm like a camel in the Arab's tent. When I come, I don't leave the place. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. <laughs> we'll do it. <laughs> sir, can I proceed, sir? Yeah, go ahead. Is, is the video on in the screen? Yeah. 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 So, uh, now as I said, to have a good grip, you need to position your forceps and as well as the foreign body as you're holding. And you can use the bronchial walls itself to position it firmly into your forceps. And as I said before, the firmness should be over the foreign body, especially when you are bringing it outside the subglottic region. So that is the most important thing that I wanted to say. So the next thing is, as Dr. JP had mentioned before, it's always, always imperative to do a check bronchoscopy. Here you can see another uh, subglottic uh, foreign body that is actually a peanut here. And we have removed it successfully. But guess what? As a routine, as a protocol, we do a check bronchoscopy. So after the removal of the peanut that was in the uh, subglottic trachea, we do a check bronchoscopy. But guess what we found? We found that there was a, another different type of foreign body. Again, a beetle nut. It is not a peanut. The first foreign body happened to be a peanut, but now it was a beetle nut or a arico nut. And as Dr. GP said, there is a lot of reactions to the beetle nut in the bronchial airway, and it happens to be a challenge sometimes. And we have to do a check bronchoscopy, and we need to remove it. So that is the tip number three. Tip number four. For this tip, I would like to show my video screen. Am I? Uh, are you able to see my uh, yes. video, sir? Web okay. Yes. So tip number four is use of a suction tube or a flexible suction cath in the bronchoscope along with your telescope. See, if this is the bronchoscope, your telescope is going to occupy this eyepiece thing. So you also have another port here. Through this port, you can pass a suction cath catheter and you can suction out without impeding your visibility. On contrary, what we usually do, we take the telescope eyes and we see through the eyepiece and we pass the suction, a rigid suction cannula through this. When we do that, the accuracy of the suction tip over the bronchi may not be good. So if you have a situation like this, like a empyema, so you have a telescope in the center and through the bronchoscope itself, you can pass a, a suction catheter like this. So this goes through that another port that I had shown you here. So as soon as I suction it, I find that there is a foreign body in the bronchus. So that happened to be a peanut and surrounding it, there is a lot of pus. Both pus was there, both distal to the foreign body as well as proximal. And again, after removal of the foreign body, we need to do a check bronchoscopy. And as we did, there was a lot of pus distally in the bronchus. And again, to correctly place the suction tip, we need visibility and you can use the advantage of this port through which you can pass your uh, suction cat and you can manipulate it and you can take it to the 
branching of the bronchioles, the segmental and the tertiary bronchioles, and you can do the suctioning and you can do the check bronchoscopy to confirm that there is no pus or there is no other uh, secondary foreign body or residual foreign body. And that would actually uh, cure this patient along with your chest physiotherapy that was mentioned before. So again, this is another situation wherein we would need to do a suctioning. If you are, this is a powdered foreign body. This was a long-standing foreign body, the peanut again. It happened to become powdered because of its long standability. And in these cases, what we do, we, we tried a suction cath and it was not coming through this. And in these things, we would have to flush it and we would have to get those smudges or the powdered thing into the trap like we do for a ball. And we collect it into the trap and we do a complete uh, clearing of that. This is how we remove the powdered foreign body. And whenever we are applying suction or whether you're applying suction or not, there is a chance of hypoxia. And as an airway surgeon, it is most, most, most important. This is the tip number five is the most important tip that we all need to master in before we venture ourselves into the airway foreign body. That is management of the hypoxia during the procedure, especially after use of the suction. So we are the airway surgeons and we are standing at the airway and we should not hold the anesthetist as liable if some instance of hypoxia or desaturation happens. He will manage the patient in whole, but you as the airway surgeon have to manage the airway and stabilize the airway. You have the ventilation port that is available in the bronchoscope that I am showing in my um, webcam. Are you able to see here, sir? Yes, yes, we can see. Yeah. So this is the ventilating port through which the anesthetist will be connecting his ventilating uh, channel through this. And uh, in spite of that, when you are irrigating and when you are suctioning, you will be noticing that there will be hypoxia that will be happening. You can see here that the patient is being ventilated, but still you can see that as I am using my suction there and suctioning the mucus plug in an infant, you can see that the patient's saturation drops pretty dramatically that too quickly. And you should also know about this 10 second rule. This saturation that is shown is actually a 10 second before saturation. So you being at the head end of the table, you have to take control of the airway and you have to secure the airway and ventilate uh, and make sure the saturation picks up. And then once the airway is stabilized and the saturation picks up and the heart rate is stabilized, then only you have to continue your rest of the procedure as I'm uh, performing here. So we complete the bronchoscopy, we uh, clear the uh, mucus plaques, and that actually uh, uh, takes care of this. And this is the tip wherein your HFNC that Dr. Rakesh mentioned would be very handy. <laughs> the tip number six, walk through the interdepartmental area. Interdepartment walk can definitely go through a long way and perhaps make you very innovative. See, we were talking about the slipping foreign body like peanut. Whenever you have a slipping vegetative foreign body, which becomes swollen because of uh, the osmotic effect, it bulges and it doesn't come out very easily through the uh, uh, bronchioles, through your optical forceps. You have two options. One is to break the foreign body into two pieces or multiple pieces and remove it, like how I'm showing here. So we are breaking the foreign body into two pieces, and then we are removing the part of the foreign body. And you have to make sure that you have to go back in and remove the distal pieces that you have left in. You have made it into tiny pieces. You can use your smaller forcepses or you can use your flexible uh, bronchoscopy and its forceps, or you can irrigate, flush it, and as the foreign body comes out, you can suction it out uh, like we do a ball. The other option is using these kind of forcepses. We, we saw this kind of forceps with the GI, and we innovated this type of a tip, uh, foreign body forceps, wherein you have this prong 
that sticks out of your uh, forceps and you can actually perforate the uh, swollen foreign body through this forceps and that has a very good grip on it and you can remove it in one go without you have to break it into multiple pieces. Similarly, for the coconut pieces, we use this type of uh, foreign body forceps. And when there is beads or balls, you can use this baskets, which can be very handy. And when you have batteries or loops, it is very, very important not to use your forceps and pick on these s charts because this will be attached to the bronchial wall. And as you are pulling this, there could be every chance of bleeding from that. And these are the instances wherein if you use your loop around these batteries, you can remove them without much of harm to the bronchial lumen. And then you can irrigate with saline and then you can suction out them. So this is another uh, challenge. This is the custard apple seed that was stuck in the left main stem bronchi. And we tried using very many types of the foreign body forceps. First, you tried uh, the peanut forceps, then we used the graspers, and then we used the various uh, thronged foreign body optical forceps. We first used the peanut, we couldn't do it, then we are trying to use the gasper. You can see that the proximal end is narrow, but the distal end is kind of swollen. So, as we come out through the subglottic region, it slips off and it goes back out. And now we are using the second type of the uh, grasper. And, uh, Again, you can see that the, as we are coming out through the subglottis, which is the narrowest part, it slips off and it goes back again. And finally, we use this urological foreign body forceps, wherein we are able to go inside and go around this uh, foreign body and we are able to remove it. The trick is, in this type of foreign body forceps, when you press it, it the tip opens up and when you leave the prong, it closes. So you need to understand the mechanism before we use it on the patient actually. So now tip number seven, all the glitters, you may think that it is better, but it's not better. So uh, here we have a, a child who has actually swallowed, aspirated a, a ring, a golden ring. And as we did the bronchoscopy, we found that there was a, a ring stuck in the trachea, but whenever we use the sheath, bronchoscopic sheath, you can see that because of the glitter, the rays that falls on the gold gets back and it glitters and you are not able to see the forceps, I mean, foreign body clearly, so we are struggling. So at this juncture, we switch off all the OT lights as well as reduce the light source lights to the least and thereby some amount of foreign body will be visible and thereby we will be able to grasp the only the ring and not the wall and thereby we will be you can see the entire OT is uh, dark as uh, you can see that only the gold is glittering and uh, that's how uh, we uh, remove this uh, the glittering foreign bodies. So tip number eight uh, the smallest bronchoscope at least until today's uh, uh, lesson learned that I heard was at least before this uh, series was that an optical forceps can be accommodated only in the uh, size 3.5. Less than that, your optical forceps will not go. But today I learned a lesson that even on 2.5, STARS is making an optical forceps that can be passed in. So thank you, sir. Thanks for the tip. But at least in India where I practice the bronchoscope uh, uh, optical forceps that is available uh, to pass in is only 3.5 and I think as a beginners you all need to know that. So and it is always recommended to use the sheath whenever you are trying to remove the for, uh, foreign body but there are exceptions like uh, Dr. JP showed. So here again we are seeing that there is a foreign body in the left bronchial. We are trying to attempt it to be removed with the sheath but as you see that it is in the distal bronchiole your uh, sheath is not able to go in and you are not able to use optical forceps because the sheath becomes a hindrance to it and these are the in instances wherein 
be fast the for optical forceps only without the sheath but with all the care that is to be taken uh, after explaining this to your anesthetist and then only if you are really really having some amount of experience only you should be doing this uh, directly passing the optical forceps without the sheath you can take it uh, by manipulating we can take it to the left main uh, left bronchiole secondary bronchiole and we are able to uh, go into the secondary bronchiole we are able to uh, take out the foreign body with just the optical forceps so these are certain exceptions tip number 9 iron foreign bodies use of cm and many other tricks so here this is a boy who had been working in a uh, iron uh, smith and a piece of the iron particle actually perforated through the neck and it went through the neck and you can see that there is a bulge in the posterior wall of the trachea when we are doing a regular pre assessment bronchoscopy and you can see that it is completely mucosalized but we can see the point of entry of the iron piece that has perforated through and through and we also did an esophagoscopy and it was not found in the esophagus then we found we understood that it should be in the tracheoesophageal groove we confirmed it with the cm and we opened the neck and with the help of endoscopic guidance we went into the tracheoesophageal groove and we did few manipulative efforts and finally we found that there was something that was stucking to our artery forceps as we are teasing the uh, tracheoesophageal groove area and finally we found that piece and we were able to remove that forceps from the tracheoesophageal groove and without any injury into the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve and post operatively the voice was also good and the patient was doing fine so so this is the end piece that was removed from the tracheoesophageal groove and we close the wound and the boy was voice is fine so similar was the same type of history wherein this was a iron bristle that entered through the airway into the tracheoesophageal groove and with this previous experience and with the ct we identified the location of this bristle and we used the uh, bristle a uh, cm to locate the uh, iron bristle because it's a feathery thin one with the cm control we identified it we made an external incision we went into the tracheoesophageal groove and we located the uh, foreign body and we were able to remove the iron uh, piece and this is the rec uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve that was uh, intact and the patient was doing fine and this is one of the most challenging uh, iron bead that was uh, in the bronchi and you can see that we were uh, this was that was the x ray and this is the uh, bronchoscopy wherein we were able to see that there was a iron bead ball bead that was stuck very firmly into the secondary bronchiole in the left secondary bronchiole that uh, you will be able to see it shortly right here we tried all our armamentarium instruments and we were not successful initially but then what we did is because it was a iron ball bead what we did is we used a little bit of common sense obviously with the discussions from our um, uh, uh, colleagues we what we did is we took a magnet and we magnetized the tip of the foreign body forceps as well as we kept a external magnet and we tried to move that iron piece little bit uh, proximally and then because the tip was magnetized we were able to uh, remove that from uh, the bronchus and we were able to successfully take it out and the most important tip uh, tip number 10 that i would give is what dr mathur sir said and what was he reiterated by jp and rakesh is never let your ego come into play discuss decide be innovative but follow the protocol and uh, do this this is uh, a uh, long standing actually 3 year long standing foreign body that was uh, in a, a child who was planned actually for a, a pneumonectomy or a lobectomy 
So uh, before that, the pediatrician asked me to do a bronchoscopy, and I found that there was pus in the right main stem bronchus. So what I did, we did the suctioning, and then we used the balloon. We 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 found that there was a narrowing there. We found that there was a narrowing in the uh, um, bronchus intermedius. This is the right upper bronchi, but this is the bronchus intermedius. But you can see that the there was a stenosis of the a firm uh, to hard stenosis of the right main stem bronchi. But through that, we uh, first what we did is we tried to use the balloon. We tried to dilate it. This is the balloon that I am showing it. We tried to dilate it. As soon as we dilated it, we thought there would be pus and we would suction it. But to our surprise, there was something that was visible that was like a part of a foreign body that was there. So then we tried to use the second uh, armamentarium that we had. That was uh, 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 another type of a uh, foreign body forceps. Then we were not able to remove it, and then we used the optical forceps. The traditional optical forceps. We are trying to hold on to this uh, uh, foreign body, but as we are trying to uh, uh, bring it proximally, there is this stenotic segment was not allowing it to bring the foreign body out. Then we tried to use the dormia basket, wherein we passed the dormia basket through and through because we saw some kind of lumen in this uh, foreign body. So we passed this dormia basket through and through, in a uh, in a uh, hope that this basket will open distally and we will be able to bring this foreign body out. But uh, to our uh, disadvantage, only the uh, basket was coming out, but the Foreign body was very much stuck in the uh, um, distal bronchiole. So we we tried to use this. We with our final manipulation, we we kind of were able to insert the scope a little more advanced, and we tried to use this uh, uh, redesigned foreign body forceps, wherein there is a, a prong there. You can see that uh, this prong we were trying to insert it through the. Uh, uh, foreign body, so that we thought it will have a firm grip, and with which we thought we will be able to remove it. But guess what? We were not able to remove it. And as the time was going on, as our speakers were uh, telling that uh, we should not meddle around the airway for a too longer time, we stopped it. We stopped the procedure at this point, and I started discussing with my seniors. I I made multiple calls to many of my colleagues, senior colleagues, senior, including G JP and uh, my teachers, and then many of them told that the only thing that we can do is we need to refer to the chest physician with the uh, thoracotomy or uh, uh, lobectomy. They have to uh, remove the foreign body forceps. But uh, uh, I was uh, going through certain articles, and finally, what we decided is I thought if I were able to. Open up this stenotic segment somehow, then we would be able to remove this foreign body without problem. So, at this juncture, the place where I was working did not have any tool to uh, dilate it apart from the balloon and the forceps that were available. I want to, at this juncture, I want to thank one of my senior uh, con uh, consultants who works in Vijayawada, Dr. Madhusudan Sharma, and her daughter, uh, who were very nice enough to. Uh, 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 give their laser, this is a diode laser that they were able to help us out. And what I did is we made uh, uh, striations using the laser. And thereby I made uh, striations like uh, similar to the Mercedes Benz, I tried to make striations, but that was not enough. So I made uh, two more striations, and then with which we were able to dilate the bronchial segment. So once this bronchial stenotic segment was dilated, then we were able to pass this one of the forceps and we were able to uh, slightly bring in through this stenotic segment. And finally, this bronchial foreign body came out and this happened to be a part of a vessel. So we were all thinking that we have uh, done a good job. And as a routine, as uh, I had told before, we were always, always uh, trying to do a check bronchoscopy, and we did a check bronchoscopy here to find another surprise. 
to find another part of this vessel that was located in one of the distal terminal bronchioles. And because it was uh, the stenotic segment was dilated, we were able to remove it with our regular optical forceps. And again, we did a, a check bronchoscopy. And finally, we were able to successfully remove this uh, foreign body without the patient have to undergo any lobectomy or uh, uh, thoracotomy. So uh, I, uh, it's very, very important to let our ego go and discuss with our seniors and uh, try to be uh, uh, innovative and do the needful. So the take home messages are, we need to evolve and adapt with each difficult scenario and find a solution uh, if such presents again. We need to be innovative and improvise and in tackling the difficult scenarios, we need to consult our friends and seniors and uh, when you face such situations and do not get the ego play in the management and you are dealing with the airway, so your reflexes have to be very quick and you need to slowly create your own instrument ornamentorium to tackle the difficult scenarios. Always take interdepartmental help, especially uh, having a trusted anesthetist, uh, both pre-op, post-op, and the pediatrician is so important. Always perform a recheck bronchoscopy at the end of your bronchoscopies to rule out a second or a residual foreign body. And a good post-op in uh, dependency care is a, a need of the hour. And a very good team effort will be uh, uh, the way forward. So learning is a never-ending process. So let's share it. And I think I learned a lot from today's uh, web series and from the previous one. Thanks to Dr. Ivan E. Raman sir for organizing such a webinar series. And uh, thank you uh, everyone for giving this wonderful, wonderful opportunity to present my uh, cases. And uh, thank my colleagues, uh, Shashi, uh, my seniors, Kishor Sandhu sir, uh, every, every panelist. I don't want to leave any one of them. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, a wonderful presentation. I've heard you before, and every time I hear you, I mean, I'm amazed at the uh, innovativeness that you've used. And thank you very much. And I'm sure all of us will start becoming as innovative as you or try to imitate you to the extent possible. Now, we have um, a site of, um, uh, okay, Sohit um, has uh, just signed off. He's uh, leaving. Thank you, Sohit, for being with us. And hopefully we'll see you in more uh, meetings. Um, nice, it was awesome. Those talks were great. I enjoyed them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, uh, is Deepak around? Deepak? Okay, we yes, got. I saw Kishore Sandhu sir. Sir. Oh, is Kishore is there? Okay, Kishore. He said he would join. Can you unmute not Kishore? No, he's not there, sir. Anymore. He's not there. Okay. So. Uh, can I interrupt you for a minute? Yeah, tell me. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, I have another engagement in about 15 minutes. Oh, right, right. Just make uh, two, three please. points. Please. You know, for yeah. instance, there is a large gathering. Yeah. You know, out of experience, I would like to share something which uh, sure, please. we are aware of. Uh, one thing that we need to keep in mind in very rare situations would be a migrating foreign body. Okay. So this is a one where uh, a foreign body would be there in the tracheobronchial tree. And often you'll find sometimes it's on the left side, sometimes it's on the right side. And perhaps these are the slightly smaller ones which get distal. In such situation, there is a requirement of, uh, you know, uh, doing bronchoscopy in, uh, you know, in different situations, not in a conventional position, but perhaps in a reverse Trentenberg or in a lateral position. And this would require a little amount of dexterity and uh, experience anesthetist along with an experienced AT surgeon. I have had three such occasions when I... Some I had to retrieve one, uh, you know, in olden days, we used to have this bronchoscope, the laryngoscope bulb. When the patient was being uh, extubated in a cardiac OT, this bulb got dislodged and went into the right side. So it was a difficult situation. We had to do this scopy in, uh, in a CCO itself and get this out because of the poor condition of the patient. Other one where the foreign body migrates would be the very small, uh, you know, remember this, uh, the metallic uh, bicycle balls. They also tend to go distal and often when you try to remove them, they run away to distal end and then you reposition, bring them to a dependent position and be able to extract it in that position. The other thing which is uh, perhaps used, be useful for all of us would be to look at uh, using uh, removal of foreign bodies which are slightly distal, which are inaccessible to our conventional this thing 
where, where uh, many of you have mentioned about use of optical forceps, I have used uh, remote such metallic foreign bodies in, under fluoroscopic control. So this is something that we can keep in mind. Third important thing I would like to make is uh, with this current uh, tendency of our pulmonologists to, you know, stent the trachea and, uh, you know, even the bronchi, especially using bare, something old uh, bare metal stents and, uh, you know, in fact, uh, uh, you know, these hybrid stents, they themselves at time becomes a foreign body because uh, the granulation tend to grow from the walls into the, uh, the strands and often it becomes, uh, it becomes a respiratory obstruction. And, um, you know, as usual, they try to remove it by flexible scopy. It is impossible to remove this bare metal strands with flexible uh, scopy. So one has to perhaps get in with a, a rigid scopy and use a little bit of your dexterity to and uh, remove the granulations first, create a little space and remove the strands, which they themselves become a foreign body in, a, um, uh, in, in such situation. The last uh, one, which uh, actually Dr. Vidya Sagar mentioned, is the use of lasers. Often long-standing foreign bodies will be disturbed to a constricted or a, uh, you know, stenotic area and uh, you could feel the foreign body, you can't remove it through the lumen. In such situations, use of lasers, and lasers are best used along with uh, rigid scopes. So this is somewhere, this is where, you know, in such critical or difficult situations, it is important that one should not uh, lose sight of the safety. And in all those situations where you're doing a scopy in, a, in an other than normal position, the greatest thing that you need to keep in mind is to keep the lumen or in the center of your scope all the time and keep adequate space between the scope and the, the uh, instrumentation so that there is some amount of play and flexibility to your movements. So this is something I wanted to highlight because uh, perhaps some youngsters are there who may be faced with such difficult situations which would help them in making a, taking such a decision. And may I thank you and uh, Dr. Pralat for um, asking me over. It would be a pleasure to be part of such discussions in future. I'm sorry I have to leave a little, uh, you know, before time. And once again, I thank and I thank all the uh, presenters and all the people who are attending it. And it's a great, great event. Thank you very much. Uh, General Venkatesh, you have uh, summarized it so beautifully. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, the the take-home messages from all the talks. Uh, we really thank you for that. Thank and you. hope to see you in our future webinars also. Surely, sir. Surely. Thank you. Uh, Yogesh, can you come out with some comments? Is Yogesh... Uh... Okay. Uh, I think Dr. Yeah, Yogesh go. left because he is he's supposed to speak in another uh, event. Oh my oh God. So we have... <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> anybody else in the audience wants to make quick points? Have I left any of the panelists? Uh, no, I don't have. I'm going to come back to the speakers in case they want to say something. But uh, we also have a short presentation. We have very little time, but then... Uh, I can ask Shashi to quickly go through a couple of things. I, I know we are missing out on answering some of the questions. Um, I think we'll get your questions answered uh, in the next session. Shashi, go ahead. Dr. Shashidhar Tathavati is with the uh, Artemis Hospital in Delhi and he is another dedicated airway man. He's part of the gang and he's always supported us with his insights, not only about airway, also his knowledge of uh, some epidemiology and the current COVID uh, crisis. He keeps giving us advice. Yeah, go ahead, Sashi. Are you there, Shashi? Oh, unmute uh, Shashi, please. Uh, Pralad? Yeah, Shashi is a co-host already. Uh, apparently yeah, he's muted. Yeah, yeah, I will, I will, I will. Yeah, okay, Shashi is ready. So oh, yeah, this, Shishi, go ahead. Yeah. This is this is just everything which has been told today to put in the practice. First of all, I'm so happy to have Dr. Mathur here. 
he was a mentor and he is one of the pioneers in pediatric ENT and uh, his experience speaks everything uh, honestly his uh, first presentation covers everything else so three cases which i want to discuss is just to add on whatever we learned today first case is a clueless pediatrician and dying child a 2 year old female with respiratory distress cough and fever barking cough crp very high 25 tlc of 22000 very high neutrophils child was given iv antibiotics steroids no improvement and even on 4 liter of oxygen there's 90% saturation now this is the x ray which some would uh, interpret you know as a steeple sign or you know narrowing of trachea somewhere over here now what are the four usual responses prepare for tracheostomy request to intubate the child as it is not an ent case uh, pose for rigid bronchoscopy do forceful flexible bronchoscopy in the icu bed itself uh, uh, without sedating the child now here the option was taken as rigid bronchoscopy the reason being uh, this was acute tracheal bacterial tracheitis and whenever you have those things there are thick membranes in the trachea and these are the ones which cause severe obstruction which is different oh. from the regular group which we see so in the subglottis of this case there was a big uh, coagulum and a membrane which we cleared off and throughout the trachea there were multiple membranes so uh, the usual reflex is if it's a infective indication we tend to avoid bronchoscopy or the anesthetist would say it's a very high risk for laryngospasm and you want to avoid the case but just for the uh, sake of differentiation uh, these membranes are actually visible in the x ray so uh, you can actually pick it up this is a usual steeple sign which is seen in uh, acute laryngotracheal bronchitis where trachea is straight in the lateral and suddenly disappears because of the laryngeal edema whereas a bacterial tracheitis will have slightly different picture where you can see multiple membranes here causing a very haphazard tracheal border so you have to respect that and high tlc toxic look will always uh, put you towards a bacterial tracheitis which must be bronched uh, either rigid or flexible and all the membranes should be cleared off and they are the ones which will not respond to the steroids so it it's very important if it's not responding to steroids and antibiotics uh, you should bronch even in infective indications now second case is a desperate father uh, with a dying child again a 4 year old child severe strider child unable to breathe and talk turned blue parents slap the back of the chest now barely breathing but alive they managed to get into the er of the hospital now this picture is not the actual father this is the picture from times magazine of an indian migrant during covid but this is taken as the you know epitome of a desperate father uh, crying for help and this happened to me uh, 14 years back uh, in La lady harding medical college and uh, with a child at 85% uh, saturation at 4 liter oxygen and with just an iv line uh, what are you going to do because everything what is written in the text is irrelevant because you have a time limit there if i had to post the case in the ot it would take 45 minutes do an x ray or a ct scan minimum 30 minutes uh, fiber optic laryngoscopy is again a 30 minutes or a bedside tracheostomy is 15 minutes what are you going to do when the child has a few minutes to li live so the option which i have exercised at that time i'm not listed here was do immediate bedside laryngoscopy with mild sedation one of the colleagues gave it Uh, metazolam and we just saw the uh, larynx and there was a foreign body in the glottis now the conventional wisdom was try to attempt it remove with a megal forceps or whatever the forceps which was available in the emergency and that could not retrieve the foreign body so next step was uh, immediately i pushed it inside with a endotracheal tube to convert a laryngeal foreign body into a tracheal uh, foreign body so that at least we have some time to buy and this is the misery of a uh, you know flip flop foreign body in the trachea it just flip flops and there's you know very difficult to retrieve and everything because it was tried by me 
two of the faculties and then the head of the department and every time we would do it this would happen we would just come up to this place and not come out entirely so in the end you know we had the tracheostomy consent and tracheostomy set ready and everything we did not do a tracheostomy however what we did was we prepared the knife for tracheostomy but kind of applied uh, viscous xylocaine uh, jelly and gave a slight flex uh, at the same time the vocal cord retrieval was attempted and uh, the problem was the you know the relaxation was not given by the anesthetist because the uh, the only way the child was surviving was by spontaneous breathing and if you give a relaxant and you don't have a control on the airway which is the biggest dilemma in this uh, so but we kind of pushed uh, the anesthetist and uh, with the cords more relaxed and with a sm small hemlick and with xylocaine it kind of came out so that's that's one of the things but before taking the case the nap was completely prepared and uh, betadine and everything was applied so that we could get into the airway within 5 minutes if required the last case is uh, a scenario where there's a scary monster and the frightened doctor 8 year old child with sudden history of choking cough unable to breathe for several uh, for 2 years episodes occur every 2 to 3 weeks more at night child treated for asthma gerd and epilepsy because they thought that strider which the patient gets as a episodic is because of the epilepsy some laryngeal variant of epilepsy and patient was given anti epileptics mother occasionally said it's abdominal cramps uh, and uh, blood workup showed nothing unremarkable but anemia and eosinophilia and a recent video by the patient definitely showed a strider by the child and a blood tinge cough was also reported so uh, same question what would you plan flexible bronch in this case hrct chest a rigid bronch or esophagoscopy or a repeat an eeg to make sure it's a uh, neurological case uh, again we went for a rigid bronchoscopy and the other thing which we kind of did in this case is stool examination because these are the really cheeky foreign bodies uh, i don't have the slide for this because it was uh, not recorded at that time but we photographed it later the child was posted in bronchoscopy and the resident gave the first pass and he did not visualize anything and i was the pool officer at that time and i came in and i said why can't you see anything and while i was putting the bronchoscope the cable fell off and when the cable fell off it went out completely draw, uh, dark for quite a, quite some time and then they took 30 minute uh, 30 seconds to 1 minute to kind of gather the cable and everything the prism and then we put it on the bronchoscope and then in the darkness when we light was switched on it was a horror scene completely horror scene there was a big worm inside the trachea and that was an escariasis worm and this was you know looking right up on your face the thing was whenever the light was shine on it uh, they are kind of shy and they go hide it inside and uh, it's only the darkness and the warm pair which was kind of promoting them to come towards it and they were coming inside the bronchoscope and as soon as we saw this uh, you know uh, i fell off the stool straight away it was such a scary sight which i'll never forget and then with some courage went back in and retrieved both of them and uh the nurse refused to be put it on the table so you know these are lying on the floor that's the only picture which i have so just to uh, make you understand that you know uh, uh leeches fishes and round worms are all important live foreign bodies which are in the airway and they should not be forgotten whenever you uh, talk about the foreign bodies it, uh, except for the pins and other things you can have uh, live insects and uh, live worms inside and uh, stool test is also important although it's not written in a textbook but uh, if patient has episodic things uh, it, it's worth it to do a stool test that it's, it's a small test presentation excellent uh, 
Excellent. Um, uh, additional information, Shashi, you always come out with something new and uh, with a lot of take home messages. So we uh, have Dr. Uh, Neeraj here. Uh, Dr. Neeraj, would you, uh, I mean, the session is almost over. Would you like to uh, pass your comments or any final things that you couldn't, didn't have the time? Uh, and meanwhile, uh, can somebody, uh, I think we are run out of time. We'll have to answer the questions in the other episode. Yes, Dr. Uh, Professor Mathur. Or anybody else wants to say something quickly, you can just uh, show of hands. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed the, uh, all the speakers speaking. It is, uh, um, you know, every foreign body is a new foreign body. And uh, some are very interesting, you know, and uh, it's very difficult uh, to uh, have in one or two hours uh, experiences, uh, uh, you know, told uh, to the audience. Uh, one thing that I would like to add here is that one uh, whistle foreign body was shown and there were two parts of whistle. So sometimes there are two parts, but there are times when there are three parts of whistle. In North India, when we get the whistle, it has three parts. Two parts are plastic rounded things, and as one is rounded completely, and the other one sometimes is rounded half um, and sliced. Uh, the, the, it's a cylindrical, sliced into half, and there is a thin plastic uh, strip over it, which vibrates and does uh, the sound. And uh, that part is usually missed because it is transparent, it is thin, it is long. So uh, always try to get the original one from the patient that uh, does it have two parts, three parts, one part, because they are all different, you know, different places. So uh, because uh, we have happened, uh, it has happened with us that uh, we removed the two parts and then there was one thin part also, which we found, suddenly found and it was lying just adjacent to the tracheal wall. And uh, it could have been missed if, uh, because it was uh, otherwise absolutely transparent. So that is um, one thing that I wanted to. Uh, the other thing is, I think Rakesh, you need be prepared for your HNFC talk. It has to be separate. We'll have it one of these days. Uh, Dr. Jay Prakash, would you like to say something? First of all, let me congratulate uh, both of you, sir, for taking such pains and arranging. Eh? But the thing you see, this is a very vast subject. We cannot cover uh, and do justice in an hour or so. Actually, in fact, in 2010, I conducted one day uh, complete uh, bronchoscopy update in my place, where luckily we had one where we, can, we have shown one uh, uh, bronchoscopy live removal of foreign body. Also, we could get uh, on that day. Actually, we informed about 300 pediatricians around. We got one case and we showed. And uh, once this pandemic is over, I'm planning to conduct. Uh, 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 update on bronchoscopy in my place and I'll invite every one of you, you're uh, welcome to come and we'll conduct a hands-on uh, mannequin course also we can conduct and yeah. uh, we can plan such a way that the lectures uh, should not overlap actually uh, if you, we, I have uh, about uh, 7 to 10 lectures on bronchoscopy actually so, honest, uh, so we can divide into many many ways, difficult situations and instruments for bronchoscopy and uh, pre-op preparation, uh, per op like so many things are there. But uh, it takes a lot of time uh, to, 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 to go into every detail. So I think uh, it's a better idea to have one day update on bronchoscopy. And we'll plan it in the future, either in uh, my place or if somewhere else, no problem. Sure, all these events have their own place. When we first yes. started off in pediatric otolaryngology, people yeah. said only pediatric otolaryngology. Then we narrowed it down only to airway. But then... <laughs> When you have a series of webinars, now that no, people no, I knew when I, was a, when, I was a, when I was a postgraduate in the command of Bangalore, you were uh, one of the pediatric otolaryngologists you were doing that time. And uh, now the uh, time has come after 20 years. Uh, so now the science have grown like uh, subspecialities like bronchology and uh, other things. Uh, thank you, everyone. So, I mean, uh, I'm sure uh, for... Uh, more depth, in-depth information. I mean, the various stalwarts who spoke today, they have their own setup where you can go and learn from them. This was just an introduction and they were very kind enough to share their experience. Uh, I'm very grateful to all of you for uh, being part of it. We had almost 180 participants at one time, I think, and Prahlad says about 18 countries. 
So it's not bad for a niche area like pediatric otolaryngology, which I keep calling an orphan specialty. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, without, I need to thank uh, Pralat. I need to thank a lot of people like Dr. Mary, Dr. Ajoy, Naina, Easy, Anju, Chaudhary from Bombay, Shashidhar, Rakesh, uh, Dr. Bilagi, the whole lot of people who work in this area of pediatrics. And of course, pioneers like Dr. Neeraj Mathur who've been working in this area for a long, long time. Thank you very much and good night. Stay safe. Take care. Thank you so yeah. much, sir. Thank you, uh, everyone. Thank, all, you. thank you very much. Do we have permission to post uh, this video on uh, YouTube? Yeah. People who missed it, uh, uh, the thing. Uh, if so, uh, Professor Mathur, sir, please raise your hand. And uh, also, Shishi, Jay Prakash, Vidya Sagar, uh, and others. Uh, who else? Uh, Prahlad always asks me and I always forget. Yeah, if yeah, yeah, your permission yeah. is there, we'll put it up on the uh, YouTube. YouTube, YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because okay, boss. Done. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, stay safe, stay home. Thank you.